uh, welcome to a virtual MLB baseball conference episode four on thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, uh, my name is Stan Conti, uh, broadcasting here from Scottsdale, Arizona at a, a nice temperature of 107 uh, degrees uh, at Conti Sports uh, Performance Therapy. Um, when we started this uh, about six weeks ago, uh, Nick Conti and Nancy Flan and myself, we decided that we really would like to do something uh, for the baseball medical community uh, since everything was shut down and everybody was locked in their houses. And we thought this would be a good idea to, to go ahead and uh, start something like this, especially being able to offer free CEUs for everybody uh, and kind of get people at least together on doing something. When we did our first episode um, four weeks ago, uh, we were excited and surprised that we had 450 people that um, registered for the for the uh, episode. We were even more shocked uh, the next week when we had 500, which was our capacity uh, with Zoom. Uh, so we uh, increased that to 1,000, knowing we would never, ever get to 1,000. Uh, but last week when we did the baseball uh, weighted ball program, we had 900 people who had registered for, and, and listened to the, to the uh, uh, episode. Uh, we have over 900 people today. Uh, so this is great. Uh, we like doing this. Uh, we hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, we do really like uh, your uh, uh, the polls at the end of the, the uh, conference telling us what we're doing well, what we're not doing well. That's really helpful. We spend actually a lot of time uh, doing that uh, and trying to make it a little bit better the next time. Um, we are going to have a flash poll, which Nancy uh, Flynn is going to put up here in a second. Uh, we did this last week uh, with the weighted balls, and it seemed to get a lot of attention, and uh, people kind of liked it. It is not a scientific poll, but we have 800 of the top people in baseball medicine here. So your opinions actually matter. So um, uh, it's four questions on thoracic outlet syndrome. You can go ahead and, and do that. And we'll give you the results of that uh, at, at the end. Uh, but we really do like the uh, uh, poll at the end too that you talk about satisfaction, what went right, what didn't go right, how, what you think we should, should uh, put in, anything you like. Those are really good uh, feedback for us uh, and helps to make it better the next time. Uh, I wanna take a, a second to talk about CEUs. There's still a little bit of confusion on CEUs. Um, everybody's gonna get CEUs, but they'll be, at, they'll, they'll be distributed at the end of all the episodes. We just don't have uh, the manpower. The manpower is me and Nancy, so we can't put out CEUs in between each episode, but you will get them uh, all, all together if, um, uh, and it'll be uh, cumulative of all the CEUs. Uh, it's really, really important for you to be able to do the survey that comes off at the end. After the program uh, is over, um, you'll get a, a, a link to a survey. Please do that survey because this, the BOC on, uh, for ATCs requires us to have that on hand, so you need to do it. You will get a second chance if you don't get it done uh, right after, uh, 24 hours after the episode, uh, you'll get an email that allow you to do the survey again. Um, if there's any questions in regards to the CEUs, go ahead and send me an email. Uh, we'll get back to you and make sure that you get it. We want everyone to get the, uh, the, uh, the CEUs. Um, uh, today on the thoracic outlet uh, uh, syndrome, we have three great speakers. Uh, highly uh, educated on TOS, uh, Dr. Gregory Pearl um, uh, from Texas Vascular Associates, uh, Regan Wong from the Texas Ranger, and Sue Falsoni uh, from Structure and Function, but also has a, a load of uh, Major League Baseball experience. So they'll, they'll be talking uh, on this thing. Um, so, okay, uh, we're gonna go ahead and just start uh, with uh, Dr. Pearl. Uh, Dr. Pearl uh, is the Chief of Division of Vascular Surgery at Baylor University, uh, his BS degree in, uh, out of University of Notre Dame Medical School at Tulane. Um, he was a resident uh, at Northwestern and also a research uh, fellow at Northwestern. He, he got his fellowship uh, on peripheral vascular surgery from uh, Dr. Jesse uh, Thompson at Baylor University. He's written many articles, but he's He's going to be talking a lot about a couple of the articles he's written 
uh, on TOS in regards to performance metrics and return, but also midterm and long-term follow-up on, on competitive athletes. What you'll find in the literature in regards to baseball is that there isn't that much uh, research done, and most of it's been done by Dr. Pearl. Uh, so we're, we're lucky to have him here. He's been practicing for 30 years, and he's performed surgery on uh, many MLB players, including this guy, Josh Beckett, who had surgery and the following year ended up throwing a no-hitter. So um, he'll, Dr. Dr. Pearl. Hi, Stan. Thank you. Uh... Very much, thank you for, and uh, Nancy for pulling this together. It's a great idea and, and a great venue to, to have a good conference on, a, I think, a very important topic. Um, I, uh, I first got interested in thoracic outlet syndrome during my general surgery <clears throat> residency at Northwestern in Chicago, and uh, I happened to be on the vascular surgery service when they operated on a couple of the uh, MLB players in Chicago, one from the Sox and, and one from the Cubs. Um, Thought it was a really interesting procedure, and and both players ended up making it back and, and having some good seasons subsequent to their their decompression. So um, my interest continued when I got down here to Texas, and then was fortunate to link up with uh, some of the, uh, the Rangers connections and uh, started getting more into the MLB side of things, and I really enjoyed it. And you know, there's certainly some controversy surrounding TOS, and I think a lot of it has to do with um, uh, in many ways, a lack of awareness and, and uh, a lack of understanding of some of the things that, that, that occur um, with initiation um, and perpetuation of the symptoms. So I want to go over uh, some of the clinical constellation symptoms that we typically look for um, in patients with thoracic outlet syndrome, especially uh, the throwing athlete. We'll go over some of the diagnostic uh, measures that we, we do and then some of the treatment options. Uh, and from with emphasis on surgery from my standpoint, we'll talk about the non-surgical stuff uh, later in the meeting. Uh, okay, there you go. Great, got it, great. So I have no disclosures. Uh, the only thing I might mention is I'm, I may mention a, you know, a couple of players' uh, names. I'm not violating any hippie issues since uh, it's all been in the mainstream press. Um, with a couple of uh, illustrative cases that we, we we're going to show. Um, so the thoracic outlet syndrome is a condition, and it's typically categorized into uh, neurogenic arterial and venous. Uh, you can see the vast uh, majority of uh, the patients present with uh, neurogenic symptoms, 95%. Uh, much less common is arterial and uh, venous, uh, about 4%. Uh, and, and really, it's in some ways a, a, a false categorization because in the condition, all three structures are, are being compressed. I mean, they all run right together through the outlet. It's, again, it's just which structures are being most uh, compressed to cause uh, the symptoms and the problems and for the patient to present uh, with issues. Uh, there's really three areas to really uh, to concentrate on uh, in points of compression. And can you see my point? Can you see the pointer uh, where I'm scrolling or no? On my mouse, I guess not. Yeah. So there's the interscaling triangle. Yes, can. And that's, uh, you can, okay, great. So it's, uh, and it's bound by the anterior scaling uh, muscle uh, anteriorly crosses and inserts under the rib between the uh, subclavian artery behind and the subclavian vein uh, uh, head uh, anteriorly. And then the plexus kind of runs through along with the artery uh, between the scaling uh, attachments and the so-called interscaling triangle. And that's where most of the uh, neurogenic and arterial issues occur is within this space. Uh, next space to consider is the caustic collicular space, and that's the space more anteriorly, uh, and the space between the collarbone and the, and the first rib. And that's the point of compression for the vein. And so you get this repetitive trauma and compression on the vein that causes uh, stenosis and, uh, to develop in the vein to the point that the flow gets so sluggish they develop a, a clot, uh, axillus clavian DVT. Um, and then the third space, and this is really a, an area that's been more recently uh, recognized and appreciated, and that's the so-called subcoracoid or subpectoral space, where once the neurovascular structures pass out lateral to the clavicle, they then pass behind the, the pec minor uh, insertion of the coracoid uh, before passing into the arm, and there can be X another point of compression between the pec minor and the ribs out more laterally. 
And uh, the, the mechanism uh, of the initiation of the condition is um, uh, really uh, it's a, 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 a type of an injury, and it can be a specific injury that the patient can relate to you that they had a, a lifting injury or a fall or a car accident, um, or more commonly, especially in the athlete, it's a it's kind of a insidious, uh, cumulative, um, repetitive injury uh, to the to the area of the outlet. It's kind of a repetitive tweaking and over stretch, stretch and tweaking of the of the scalenes and the and the and the pec. And the, the anterior scalene and the, and the pec are really predominantly stabilizers. They don't really move anything. So they've really got a preponderance of more the kind of the type one slow twitch stabilizing type muscle, which seems to be more predisposed to spasm and contraction with, uh, with stimulation. And so it's, again, it's more of a, again, especially with the athletes as a repetitive motion type uh, cumulative event. And then a small number of patients will just say, hey, I woke up one day and my arm was numb and it never went away. So the small number of patients, they may not even know what may have caused it. Um, again, with the symptom complex we see with neurogenics, mainly they complain of pain uh, up in the uh, pain and tightness up in the neck, upper back, uh, upper chest, periclavicular area, and then there's referred to uh, pain uh, out into the shoulder, elbow, forearm, uh, wrist, hand. It can really be referred anywhere into the extremity. Um, numbness and tingling is exceedingly common. I always get a little bit worried about the diagnosis or concerned about if that's really what they've got us, if, if they don't complain of any numbness or tingling or uh, alteration in sensation of their hand or digits. And then, and then the weakness, uh, especially uh, the, the pitchers complain of just a alteration or change in their grip strength, kind of a change in how they feel the ball, a feel for the ball, um, difficulty with pitch placement, uh, velocity, et cetera. And then with the vascular gen, the <clears throat> venous is the so-called uh, Paget Schroeder, um, uh, where they get a big swollen, congested blue arm, and it's an uh, axillary subclavian DVT. And then the arterial, which is the least common. And typically for arterial, they, they typically have, uh, uh, and that can affect either the subclavian artery or the axillary artery or its branches. With the subclavian arterial uh, TOS, it, they usually need to have some type of bony anomaly, uh, which is not true with the neurogenic uh, group. Uh, where they usually they, they'll have a cervical rib or an abnormal first rib, uh, such as a, a fusion of the first to the second rib, instead of the first rib co curving all the way around and attaching anteriorly to the manubrium, it'll just go straight down and, and attach down to the second rib, and that makes kind of a bulky bony mass right behind the clavicle that closes the space down to predispose it to <coughs> compression and damage to the artery. Um, and, and then we'll talk more about axillary ar arterial issues, uh, which are a little bit of, of, of a different flavor than the subclavian, but the bottom line is they present with ischemic symptoms. They get digital ischemic type symptoms, um, uh, uh, pretty profound arm fatigue, weakness, uh, et cetera, with use. But the main thing is looking for ischemic changes from embolization uh, distally. On examination, uh, uh, we always look at, uh, the first thing I always look for is posture, you know, with these, these young athletes, especially the teenagers, you walk in the exam room and they're sitting on the exam table completely slumped, slumped forward, you know, head, neck, shoulders all rolled forward, usually looking at their phone. Um, so it's all very important to you know, work on postural correction. I will, will hear more about this from Sue uh, and Reagan. Um, we look for any areas of venous distension, especially up over the delta pectoral area or, or uh, periclavicular area. It could suggest proximal uh, subclavian vein compression or uh, stenosis. Swelling, skin or color change the extremity. That's what we look for with the, the venous and the arterial uh, situation. Some patients have such profound neurogenic compression, they will de develop visible atrophy, uh, mostly kind of in the uh, hand intrinsics, uh, thaner, hypothaner, eminent, et cetera. Um, one of the findings that's, that's extremely uh, reproducible and present in almost everybody with, with TOS is they're, they're really tender over the outlet. I mean, palpate up over their scaling triangle and you know they'll wince or they'll kind of pull pull back away from you and um, uh, there's definite demonstrable tenderness on the vast majority of 99 plus percent of these patients and um, and then with a cervical rib or a bony anomaly those can oftentimes be palpated on exam especially the cervical rib they've got a big hard bony mass sticking up through the supraclavicular fossa and then with pec minor uh, they're going to be uh, involved, but they're going to have tenderness over the pec minor insertion over the kind of over the coracoid area as well. 
And then we, pay, we put the patients through provocative uh, maneuvers, uh, adsons and rights are getting their arms up, you know, right angles, head and neck uh, turned, ipsilateral, contralateral. Um, the roots test is the EAST test, so-called EAST test is the elevated arm stress test where they have their arms up 90 degrees and rapidly uh, open and close their hands. And if they get marked fatigue, first of all, you can pair side to side. And then you also time it, and so if it's so can, if it gets markedly fatigued at less than a minute, that's a markedly positive test. Three minutes or less is a moderately positive test. If we go more than three minutes, it's a negative test. In most of these patients, by the time they see me, um, I mean, as soon as I get their arm up over their head, they they say, oh, my hand's numb, <clears throat> that my arm feels heavy, it's aching. They, they come on almost instantaneously. So it's it's ten, tends not to be a real subtle. Uh, exam finding. And then again, with those maneuvers, we're, we're looking for uh, alteration and dampening of, of the pulses or um, coloration of the hand, uh, etc. Uh, imaging with this is really the importance of it is really to define the anatomy, especially someone that would undergoing consideration for surgery. Again, looking for bony anomalies, uh, clavicular deformities, cervical ribs, etc. Um, and for the neurogenic patients, it can be kind of supportive. Um, but really not diagnostic because uh, in the neurogenic stuff, usually the anatomy is basic, is, looks pretty normal on imaging studies because it's really more, rather than having a, a structural issue, it's more of a, a, it's more of a functional issue from the repetitive overuse in these, you know, these muscular components we've talked about, the, the scalene attachments of the pec minor just uh, getting uh, tight and shortened and, and starting to trap the neurovascular bundle uh, against the ribs. Uh, for vasculogenic, of course, it, it, the studies, imaging studies can be very helpful and, and definitive, and we'll look at some of those uh, moving forward. But again, the most important thing is taking a careful history, trying to elicit the appropriate clinical constellation of symptoms, and uh, doing a really good <clears throat> detailed physical examination with the provocative movers we've, we've, we've talked about. Again, chest x-ray, we're, again, we're looking for, for bony anomalies. Um, pathogenesis, again, it's felt that, again, with the anterior scaling and the pec minor, the muscle kind of stabilizers, preponderance of type 1 fibers that are more predisposed to, to shortening and, and contraction and, and over time fibrosis and scarring. Again, looking for any bony anomalies. And then, again, in the history, it's important to take uh, a careful history about, uh, especially for the non-athlete, it's more important, any history of trauma or, or occupational issues. And, of course, with the athlete, it's, it's self-evident. They're um, throwing a baseball 100 miles an hour over and over again. Uh, this is an example of a, just a plain chest X-ray, and you can see up here. These are this is a uh, young woman with bilateral cervical ribs, and again, they can be pretty subtle. This is the first rib here on either side, curving around, goes off the transverse process of T1, which is the the first upgoing transverse process you come to. First rib there, crossing around, and then when if you see any rib coming off a straight transverse or Downgoing transverse process. That's a cervical. That's a cervical rib. Again, the, the T1 transverse process is always kind of easy to see and upward going. <clears throat> and so, and because the cervical ribs can be more cartilaginous than they are bony, so they can be hard to see um, on the next ray. Um, so you have to look pretty pretty hard. But if you see anything coming off the, the C7 vertebra uh, above the T1 transverse process, that's a cervical rib. Uh, this is just patient putting a demonstration of, of not just feeling the pulses with our, our doing a palpation with our fingers, but we put them through uh, some non-invasive Doppler study. This is one of our fellows a few years ago, Jason Woolard, uh, now practicing up in Kansas. Uh, but we just hook up a, a plethysmographic uh, cuff onto their finger, and then we put them through the various positions that you see demonstrated here. And then we're looking at the waveforms as you see here. And this is actually this is actually a study on Jared Saltimalakia. Uh, several years ago, who I guess we're going to talk about the yips, and he kind of sort of had the yips. Um, he could barely throw the ball back to the pitcher, much less second base. Um, uh, but on his study, you can see he's got normal waveforms um, in certain positions, but you can see it totally flattens with the hyperabduction and the military brace and everything. So it's uh, it really compressed the subclavian artery, flattened the waveforms again, which is supportive of, of neurovascular compression uh, of the diagnosis, again, as someone that's got the cl appropriate clinical constellation of symptoms and findings on physical examination that we've talked about. Um, sometimes with, uh, uh, 
with an ultrasound, you can actually miss um, uh, an acute DVT because it's the clot is so soft. Um, it's, it's not really uh, sonolucent. So this intravascular ultrasound, this is the probe, this is the, the vein. And you can see all that red stuff you saw earlier on in the, as it was running through, um, was the blood flowing around the probe. And you see now the blood flow, this red coloration coming down to almost nothing because it's, this, we're now in, uh, incinating within a very tight stenosis. And you can see all this bright kind of white stuff around the probe too. That's all cicatricial scar tissue uh, along the endoluminal surface of the vein. And then again, it's due to a uh, just repetitive pinching and compression and injury to the subclavian vein to where it developed a severe uh, fibrotic stenosis. And now we're going back, to, we're going further down into the anomalous vein. So we're through the stenosis. So now, now we're down to the anomalous vein. You see the big, nice color, good flow around all that area. The stenosis. And this was actually on Hank Blaylock. Uh, a few years back, uh, he got a big swollen congested arm when they were playing, <clears throat> I think they were playing in Florida. And sure, and, and he did go to the ER in Florida. They did a sonogram. They said, nah, no blood clot, everything looks good. And uh, he came back to, to Dallas and, and uh, we did this study and sure enough, he had, didn't have a DVT, but he had a very tight cicatricial stenosis. So we did a venogram on him and you can see right here, it's just kind of, napkin ring sort of tight stenosis right as it's crossing the first strip. This is where the first strip, it's a subtraction digital film, so the bones are kind of subtracted out, but this is the first strip curving right around here. Here's clavicle, first strip. This is right where the clavicle and the first strip are crossing. And that's right where you see this tight stenosis. And again, it's just a reflection of repetitive trauma and pinching and, and scar tissue development within the vein. And again, most patients that would get to this point of, of stenosis would develop, would develop a clot. And then we decompressed them. And without doing anything to the vein, you can just see it's opened up a bit more here without even doing any, any uh, angioplasty or anything to the vein. And uh, then we'll oftentimes touch this up with a balloon after we uh, do the decompression. And uh, he went on to do well, ended up, uh, I think his first game back, he had a grand slam. Um, so uh, again, looking at the anatomic, uh, considerations in the approach with the surgery. Uh, we just make, we do the uh, procedure through a little supraclavicular incision, a little transverse incision above the clavicle. Taking the first rib out can also be done through what's called a transaxillary uh, incision, uh, uh, kind of along the hairline under the arm. Um, about, you know, there's, there's lots of discussion about this amongst uh, those of us that do the supraclavicular approach and those of us who do the, the, do the transaxillary approach. But about the only thing you can do well from the axilla is take the rib out, which may be the least important part of the procedure for neurogenic symptoms because it, uh, it's very important uh, and, and paramount. You do a really thorough scalenectomy and brachial plexus neurolysis to make sure that all the adhesive bands or any cartilaginous bands that could be compressing things in, um, up along that area that you wouldn't see from the axilla need to be excised and get everything really well decompressed. So we, we definitely favor this approach. Um, Let's see, this thing is blocky one, there we go. Um, and again, you can just see where the neurovascular bundle's crossing through in this tight space between the clavicle, top rib, and scaling attachments. This is an operative photo. Uh, and again, just to demonstrate the real culprit here, this big muscle with the blue loop around it is the anterior scaling attachment. This is the subclavian artery here with the red loop around it. And so you can just, and then, so the, the, the rib and collarbone are down here, patient's head is up here. So the anterior scalar muscle arises from the lower cervical vertebra and comes down and inserts onto the top rib. As it runs down and inserts onto the rib, it's crossing over the artery. And what you don't see here just yet is the, the brachial plexus uh, behind. You see a little hint of it right there. Um, but this is the muscle that gets very tight and contracted. There's usually dense fascial bands here. And it's what, when that is getting tight, that's compressing the artery and the plexus between the muscle here. And then what you don't see here again is, is the rib. The rib is curving behind here. We'll see, see things open up a little bit better here. In a sec, here's after we've divided it. We're pulling it down with forceps, it's been divided and cut. You see the artery a little bit better. Again, head up here, clavicle down here. Plexus will be up here. And this is after it's all been removed, 
again, arteries down here. This is the plexus now completely uncovered. Again, this was being all completely covered by the anterior scalene muscle running down and starting under the top rib down here. But you can see everything's kind of free and flapping in the breeze. And what used to be behind here, and we just couldn't get a picture of it, is the rib. And the rib is now gone as well. So it's just a big open space here with everything passing through unencumbered. And then just another look at the same thing. And we get all the way back to the nerve roots, individual nerve roots of the plexus. Um, again, arteries way back here now. This is T1, this is C8, this is C7 nerve roots. They typically kind of come out and then join quickly together to form the lower uh, division of the plexus. Upper plexus up here, C5, C6 uh, contribution up here. This is just a sponge packed back to where we, the rib used to be. The rib and middle scaling used to be back here and then they've been excised. But that just demonstrates the decompressed anatomy all the way back to the nerve roots. And you can see we do this through a fairly small incision. We can get a pretty big rib out of a pretty small incision. Everything kind of opens up nicely once we get down in there. But this anterior part of the rib, this is the part that was hooked to the maneuvering uh, to the upper part of the sternum. And this is the back part where it was articulating with the transfer process and the, and the T1 vertebra. And so you get a pretty big hunk of bone out of here. And again, these are all the muscular attachments. This here was the scalene attachment here, the cut, in, cut edges of the scalene, anterior scalene muscle. This is middle scalene attachment out here. And this is just some intercostal attachment back here. This is pec minor. So we do this through a, a kind of a small delta pectoral incision in the, in the delta pectoral crease. And you can see the, <clears throat> this is the coracoid up here. Insertion of the pec minor for the coracoid. And again, what we don't see running behind here is the neurovascular bundle <clears throat> uh, where it's being compressed between the tight pec minor and then the, the lateral part of the ribs behind. This is what things look like and when we close things up. Again, little uh, superclavicular incision, delta pectoral incision. We leave it drain in place to just keep in for a couple days to drain any serous fluid, blood, air, et cetera. It comes out usually the second morning after surgery. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, this just kind of shows how well things heal. This is not of such a, a consideration for the, you know, the guys, bearded guy here, but for the cute young girls that uh, are, are softball, volleyball players, uh, you can see you get a pretty nicely healed scar. You gotta look pretty hard to look, uh, to, to, to find ultimately. So again, special considerations is the competitive athlete, which is really what, we're, what we wanna talk about more today. And their, their general presentation, they are the, the symptoms that we see in the, in the general TOS population. But again, we're looking for more nuanced stuff that's uh, specifically related to their, uh, their throwing activities um, or other athletic activities, the case may be. Um, so again, we're looking out for all these same general things, pain at times, the neck, upper back, uh, shoulder, upper chest, and then the pain numbness tingling in the extremity. But again, more nuanced stuff. Uh, like I, I mentioned, the pictures of the plane about a loss of feel for the ball. Uh, ball just doesn't feel right in their hand. Uh, their motion just, they just don't feel like they can get their mechanics and their motion feeling right. The release point doesn't feel good. Just, just all subtle, nuanced kind of stuff that they complain about. In addition to loss of velocity and arm fatigue, uh, longer recovery times, et cetera. And so there are unique challenges in the, the high-performance elite athletes. There's, there can be various confounding factors. It can uh, lead to a missed or delayed diagnosis. A lot of these guys have had Tommy John or have had other uh, shoulder issues, labral issues, rotator cuffs, um, uh, et cetera. That may kind of throw things off and emphasis put on some of the more commonly seen things that you see in a thrown out athlete. And then to begin, that would again be shoulder and, and uh, elbow issues. So that can kind of confound things and, and, and kind of uh, keep TOS from uh, jumping, jumping out at you uh, as, a, as a leading diagnosis when you're thinking of more common uh, things that you're going to see in the ball players, uh, and then again, again, all these players are they're 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 on a they're all on a, a kind of a timeline. You know, they get very frustrated when they can't they can't play and they can't pitch. You know, there's issues around the around the season. When, you know, when the season's coming up, when spring training training's coming up, there can be contract issues that come into play, scholarship issues that come into play, all kinds of things that uh, that can lead to a lot of frustration and anxiety and and. Uh, 
uh, difficulties with their expectations. So we're, we're, we try to move along quickly with these guys uh, and girls, to get them back playing. And again, it's really related just to the repetitive, exaggerated uh, overuse and, and tweaking of, of uh, muscle groups we've talked about. And these are all the groups we see. And, and as Stan had, had mentioned earlier, the, by far and away the most common athletes we see are the, the baseball, softball athletes. Uh, again, we talked about these uh, symptoms that we, they typically complain about. They're a little bit more nuanced for them. And then again, there could be a long differential diagnosis that it needs to be considered by the athletic trainers and, and therapists and, and physicians. And it could be just uh, you got a you know, your muscle strain, a little tendonitis, bursitis, slap tear, et cetera. And so those things often need to be investigated, interrogated, and ruled out, um, uh, which again, uh, I'm always, uh, it makes it easy for me because all that stuff's pretty much been done by the time they're sent to see me. So uh, they've usually had per, pretty thorough workups by the time they come to see us. Um, we, we know how, you know, our, our, our uh, high performance elite, uh, high profile athletes do because it's always in the newspaper. You can always look them up online and everything, but how, how are all the other lads, athletes doing? So we, we did a survey um, uh, looking at our, our, again, specifically our athletes. So we had 232 competitive athletes uh, within the timeline and uh, we had uh, 67 of them responded. And we basically wanted to know, how are you doing? What's going on? Some of them were, you know, inside of a year, but some of them were outside of a year. Because I think that is kind of an important uh, uh, point in the recovery process is um, that six months to a year time frame. If you're kind of inside of that, it's uh, your outcomes, are, I think you're still going to be a little bit uh, tainted. Because um, it sometimes takes a little bit longer, especially from the getting all the, the refinements of the mechanics and everything back in place and all the strength back. It can take, take a little over a year sometimes. And so, again, we, we had the, the athletes, the six of respondents, that's the gender split, those are the ages. Uh, uh, this actually was a, this actually was a uh, MLB player. He was in the farm system, 48 years old. God love him. Um, again, you see the uh, differentiation of the, the sports. Um, I actually have been seeing more swimmers lately for some for some reason, but lots of lots of ball players. Uh, these are the kind of things we looked looked at, um, and uh, so we were measuring. Did they get off all their pain medication? At the point in time we were we were talking to them, were they did they have an outcome that they felt like yeah if I know what I know now yes I definitely go through the procedure again. That's three quarters of them. Over 80% of them had resolution of all their TOS symptoms. They were doing uh, activities of daily living over 90% uh, readily without issues. 73% return to the same or better level of athletic performance. And again, I think this number will go up as we get further out in the follow-up. Some of these patients, some of these patients were still inside of a year. And most of them felt like they made the right decision to go ahead with the procedure and, and get fixed. And this is a, a, stu a study that Rob Thompson and I did a, uh, a couple of years ago, and we wanted to look at some of the pitching metrics that, performance metrics that uh, are looked at and measured in, in ball players. And those uh, we, we picked up from before they had the surgery to uh, compared to uh, after they recovered. And uh, <clears throat> we had 13 MLB, MLB pitchers. Now we d we didn't look at the the non pitchers, but we had several MLB non-pitcher pitching athletes as well but we came up with 13 pitchers for, for neurogenic again we didn't look at any, any of the vascular patients and there were 10 that we had a sustained re return to play we looked at 15 traditional pitching metrics their win losses strikeouts walks hits per inning pitched uh, era etc and then some of the fs me fx metrics that can be looked at and found that uh, uh, there was no really no difference between three years prior and three years post treatment when we compared the groups that made a sustained return to, to play, and uh, you can see the issues here with 75% um, of them were unchanged, 20% were improved, and a small percentage felt they may have been uh, there may have been a little drop off, but not quite back to where they were. This is a uh, something that's uh, fairly unique to to the. the Major League Baseball pitchers. Um, I think I've seen one collegiate pitcher, but almost all the others have been Major League Baseball pitchers. And it's actually a uh, uh, something that's very relevant to a, an MLB, a very high profile MLB player uh, right now with the Yankees. And that's a non-union first rib fracture. 
And it's just, uh, again, these remarkable, unbelievably strains uh, 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 and violent forces these guys are putting across <clears throat> their upper torso. They can actually crack a rib. And, uh, and with a first rib fracture, it has a very high rate of non-union or malunion. And, um, so that's with this persistent lucency. This is several months out. Rib has uh, failed to heal. There's a little bit of instability that goes along with this. So they have persistent pain. They get kind of a little bit of a phlegmon from the callus around it that, that uh, irritates the neurovascular bundle that's running right along that area. Uh, so they get the pain from the non-union fracture, and then they also get some of the neurogenic uh, issues from, uh, from the inflammation around the callus. This is how, where it's showing it, where it lights up on a bone scan. First strip there lights up on the bone scan. And this is what it looks like when we take it out. You see you got this big kind of callus around it. And I could, I could actually take this bone between my two hands and, and just break it right at the spot right here because it was just a, sort of a non-ossified, non-union, just looking at it from a different direction on the undersurface. So that's kind of it with the neurogenic stuff. Um, uh, again, we'll talk more about all the, the rehab and recovery process uh, with the other talks. Um, the arterial uh, TOS is it's, uh, seen much less commonly, but it's exceedingly important to make a, 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 the diagnosis in a timely way because, as I said uh, early in the discussion uh, today, the presentation of ischemia. Ischemia means uh, lack of blood flow to tissue, and it can be so profound it can actually the, the patients can actually get into a, a digit or, or limb threatening situation. Uh, they continue to experience ongoing prolonged ischemia. So it's very important uh, to recognize it, make an early timely diagnosis, and get it fixed. And again, even with the arterial, it can be a, a single acute event where they just, they just feel like I, I threw and my hand went numb and it got cold and it turned colors. And that's probably when they, they, they did a throw and a little bit of clot broke off and, and floated down into their hand and, and it was a single acute event. But again, it was something that would it had, uh, was cumulative uh, and developed over time. And, uh, or some will just come with uh, complaints of an insidious more progressive kind of history where you know, I've developed this callus onto my finger, it's really sore, it won't heal, it won't go away. My fingers feel funny, they're really sensitive and it could be more insidious progressive kind of thing. And then on exam, we're looking for a pulsatile mass, you know, subclavian aneurysm, palpable bony abnormality like a, a clavicular deformity or a, a cervical rib. Examination for you know digital ischemia. We'll, I'll show you a picture of that. You know some of these will present with a really profound Raynaud's with cold exposure. Their fingers just turn white and very uncomfortable. And again, they have the attendant uh, uh, neurogenic and and uh, arterial type symptoms of a lot of arm fatigue and pain with throwing. And so th therapy is directed at number one. Once the, the diagnosis is made, is to uh, identify the source, uh, relieve the point of compression, correct the arterial source, whether it's an aneurysm uh, or thrombus, restore perfusion of the extremity, and stop uh, any ongoing uh, thrombotic or embolic events. And so again, this is a patient here with a cervical rib, and this was actually a young female soccer player, and she went on with months with her hand just getting more and more painful. Cervical rib right here, see it coming off, here's T1, and that's the first rib coming off T1, See, this rib up here is coming off C7, so it's a cervical rib, and it's going down and attaching on and synostosis to the first rib. Here's a close-up of it here. See, it's coming off C7, coming down, synostosis to the first rib. First rib, cervical rib. This post-op, so uh, if they have an arterial complication with a cervical rib, I, I take out the cervical rib, but I also always take out the first rib to really be sure we have a really wide open thorough decompression and plenty of room for the arterial reconstruction to, to not get banged up and have a problem down the road. So this is uh, cervical, first rib excised, little drain in where we, uh, and this is a, the duplex that we did ahead of time. This is uh, the subclavian aneurysm. You can see the kind of this flap and thrombus in there. Um, you can see the, uh, Arteries, uh, we don't have a measurement on here, but it's measuring over the typical six or seven or eight millimeter size. This is over a centimeter. 
and you see this big organized mural thrombus with a little piece of thrombus flapping around. Like it's not too hard to imagine some of this breaking off and going downstream and uh, causing us ischemic issues. Here it is putting some color to it, same thing. Here you see the color flow. And you can just see this kind of floppy, flapping thing here and this kind of solid organized thrombus. Here it is in a longitudinal view. And the same thing you can see, I can see it's, uh, there was a measurement here, but it, it measures it measures like 1.1 centimeters and that's that's an abnormally large vessel. Again, so claimant already typically measures about six to seven millimeters in most patients. Here it is at uh, time of surgery when you opened it. Um, this is the proximal subclavian artery clamped, distal clamped. You can see the clamp down here. We open the aneurysm. Here's this mural gelatinous kind of fibrotic thrombus that had been embolized down to the arm and hand. And then we just reconstruct with a short interposition PTFE graft. That's the proximal osmosis, distal osmosis right behind this little skin flap here. And here's the bone. This is the first rib. This little projection off here is where the cervical rib came down and uh, went down and attached to it. And so again, the important thing is the awareness and recognition of the source. Um, and again, the other point that we look at is um, axillary artery and its branches. And uh, I think there's getting to be more and more recognition of uh, posterior circumflex humeral aneurysms. Uh, it's one of the two main branches off the initial branch off the axillary artery, the anterior and posterior circumflex humerals. Posterior branch in particular, uh, and it's probably a, a repetitive stretching or tethering effect, uh, again, with all these stresses and stretches placed across the area with the throwing motion, uh, with, you know, humeral heads kind of subluxing a little bit and banging against it. Uh, you got these big overdeveloped muscles compressing it and pulling on it, again, traction, torsion, and stretch of the artery. And that can lead to the, the thrombosis in the entire artery or development of this, this posterior circumflex humeral aneurysm. And again, they can, and they can typically present with digital ischemia. So this is a, a, a picture complaining of a really painful tip of his digit here. Discoloration wouldn't go away. It was getting more and more painful, more and more sensitive. That's the tip of a kind of a painful hard cow so it wouldn't heal. This is a picture he took himself of uh, when he had a little cold exposure and saw how white the, the, the digit turn with a little Raynaud's uh, response. This is the arteriogram. You can see the radial artery coming down here. Ulnar artery should be coming here. Ulnar artery's gone. You can see the um, these connecting and palmar arch are, are kind of broken up and beat up and, and the digital vessels are all cut off and spastic and not completely filling all the digits. This is all a, a, a manifestation and reflection of, of repetitive micro uh, digital embolization. This is the ultrasound we did in the office uh, looking for the source because we you know we always look at the subclavian artery first and that was normal so we go then we move out and look at the axillary artery and here you can see this little bubble coming off the bottom of the axillary artery and this is the posterior circumflex humeral aneurysm and with a little thrombus in it. And you can see these are just all muscles around it you can just imagine you, you know repetitively stretching and, tens and tensing those big muscles with a throwing motion so it's just going to mash up, mash on that uh, aneurysm and, and push that thrombus out. Again, here it is with some color. Here's the axillary artery, and here's the aneurysm. This is the, at the time of surgery, axillary artery, proximal axillary artery, distal. This is the aneurysm coming off the bottom of it. Posterior circumflex branch, aneurysmal. This, these are kind of some of the nerve branches. Here it is opened up. You see this big broad mouth to it, you know, the, the opening, the orifice of the posterior circumflex branch should just be a little tiny circle here. You can see this big broad mouth and you can see the thrombus down within the uh, mouth of it. So we just do an end, what's called an endoaneurysm morph, we kind of sew off the vessel to sew off the mouth of the aneurysm. Um, we don't actually take it out because to get it way back in there and kind of dig it out could, could cause some bleeding and, and some nerve injury potentially. And so we just sew it off from the inside and then we patch the artery. And that, uh, that fixes it. So haven't covered everything. Uh, I mean, it's all really interesting stuff. And we're, we're doing a lot of work and continue to do a lot of work, but there remains some, some gaps still. So there's still a gap in awareness and recognition of TOS and its management. So the key thing is, you know, uh, 
thinking about it, especially in that patient that has that, again, that appropriate uh, clinical constellation of symptoms and uh, other stuff that you typically see in, in ball players doesn't turn up on evaluation, such as, you know, lay roll issues or elbow issues, et cetera. So think about it and, uh, and then embark on the evaluation that we've talked about uh, that we do here with the, the good physical examination, um, non-invasive uh, imaging, uh, digital pressure measurements when, when uh, applicable, and then some, some uh, additional imaging uh, as uh, directed. Um, we've, but we do have a, a need for improvement and refinement of some of these uh, uh, diagnostic uh, measures. Uh, and again, that's where some of the controversy comes in because, again, we're used to getting imaging studies and saying, oh, there it is, it's a structural issue, there it is on the MRI or on the CAT scan. We don't see that in TOS, again, because it's more of a functional, uh, provocative type uh, syndrome. And we definitely have a, a need for more robust long-term outcomes. We continue to work on that. We're, we, we're continuously looking at our, our outcomes and doing follow-ups with our patients, and we'll continue to re report those to you. So the take-home points are accurate and timely diagnosis of paramount, successful treatment, TOS, and the elite athlete. And excellent outcomes may be achieved with return to high function following surgical treatments as determined by patient self-assessment survey and objective performance uh, metrics that, as we did in our two studies. And uh, here's uh, Matt Harrison. Um, actually, we ended up doing bilateral on him, and this is uh, Kat Osterman. So Matt made it back, and. When it, uh, 17 or 18 games his first season back after uh, we did his uh, left side and Kat made it back playing the Olympics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pearl. That was great. Uh, I'm going to move on to Regan. Uh, Regan Wong, a, a PT for the uh, Texas Rangers, uh, his education um, undergrad in uh, BS in Ithaca College, uh, also the alma mater of Nancy Patterson, um, Patterson Flynn, sorry, graduate uh, uh, master's in PT at Ithaca, did, did his DPT degree from University of St. Augustine in Florida. He's board certified by the American uh, Physical Therapy Association, both orthopedic and sports physical therapy, the manual ther therapy certified uh, CSCS, and certified in dry needling. Um, professional experiences in the University of Rochester, New, New York, uh, clinical director in private practice in Central Florida. He worked 10 years as the former director of rehabilitation at TMI Sports Medicine in Texas. Uh, now in his sixth season with the Texas Rangers and second on the major league staff. He's had multiple publications um, in uh, top journals, um, and he currently resides in Mansfield, Texas with his wife, Kelly, three children, Emma, Ryan, and Kyle. Regan, you're up. Thank you, Stan, for the introduction, and I'm humbled to have been asked to be able to speak today. Uh, thank you to Nancy and yourself for uh, all the work behind the scenes and putting these great uh, uh, webinars together. Let me just try to get this going here. Share screen. From a disclosure standpoint, I have nothing to disclose. As Dr. Pearl had mentioned, thoracic outlet syndrome can sometimes be misconstrued as a singular entity, when in fact there are three subtypes uh, based on the definitions established by the Society for Vascular Surgery. So my talk will focus primarily on one of those subtypes, and that is neurogenic TOS, which has been reported to comprise of 90, 95% of all cases. I believe that understanding the cause, the strong knowledge of anatomy and provide a good evaluation will equal a good TOS rehab approach. So as Dr. Pearl had mentioned, and I'll go over quickly, neurogenic TOS can be caused by the repetitive overhead throwing in pitchers, which is the movement cause. The plexus is stretched with extreme horizontal abduction and external rotation of the shoulder in which the nerves can be entrapped by the anatomical structures or the static cause. So these are the exact same entrapment points that uh, Dr. Pearl had mentioned. Uh, I just included them uh, just for completeness. Uh, the two primary areas for neurogenic TOS that has been thought to have comprised uh, to be compromised is between the anterior middle scalenes or the scalene triangle 
and of the uh, subcorcoid region uh, where the pec minor attaches to the corcoid process. It is not unusual to observe hypertrophy of the scalenes as well as the SCN muscles in pitchers on their dominant side. Ask them to turn their head to the opposite side and have them sniff through their nose. Their anterior scalene may pop out, which will reveal its hypertrophy. This will create less space and thus an entrapment point at the scalene triangle. Poor posture can be a contributing part of the problem, create what Vladimir Yanda described as the upper cross syndrome. This is characterized by tight, tight overactive pecs, upper traps, and a weakened deep cervical neck flexors and scapular stabilizers. So tight pecs can create a protracted shoulder position, thus uh, causing compression and less space at the subcoracoid region. So here's a simple way to assess pec tightness by having them lie on their backs and their clasp their hands behind their head as if they are daydreaming. From the side, observe if their elbows can drop parallel or pass parallel with their body line. An inability to do so indicates tight pec muscles. These next two slides are the same subjective complaints common in baseball players um, with suspected neurogenic TOS. Dr. Pearl went over these same ones and I included them in my talk just for completeness. Um, but the key ones for baseball is like their lack of ability to feel the ball or trouble locating, performance fatigue earlier than usual. They may say that they felt like they pitched seven to eight innings when in fact they maybe only pitched two to three, and the heaviness or the dead arm uh, sensation. Very common that they're going to complain of numbness and tingling in their arm when in the overhead position. Usually it's like a gradual onset uh, in, in pitchers. Uh, may notice some increased edema post outing and, and be, be sure in your subjective history, maybe ob obtain if they ever had a history of a clavicle fracture or first rib stress fracture. Here's an interesting study conducted by doctors Kevin Lawner and Keith Meister in 2014 in the Texas Rangers organization. They used diagnostic ultrasound to measure bilateral brachial artery blood flow in healthy asymptomatic professional pitchers and position players. They measure the arm at the side and up in the 90-90 provocative position. Examiners were blinded to the subject's position or arm dominance. The results demonstrate that the throwing arm of pitchers had significant less blood flow volume in the provocative 90-90 shoulder position compared to the non-throwing arm. No difference in pitchers with arms at the side, no difference in position players in either testing position, no other between, between group differences. So it is hard to believe that less blood flow in the pitcher's throwing arm in the overhead position is a positive adaptation for them in the long run. It underscores that pitchers who throw much more compared to position players could be the group of players most at risk for developing TOS. Uh, Dr. Pearl did a great, great job of going over his clinical exam. Um, I would like to take a moment to review the importance of the highlighted items uh, of the clinical exam that is unique to TOS uh, from, the, from the perspective from the rehabilitation specialist. Taking the time to properly assess the static posture of the individual, it will provide you valuable information to compare with the active SCAP assessment to help develop your approach. It is critical to have correct assessment to guide your treatment approach. For instance, is there a flat horizontal clavicle, which is an abnormal sign? Is there a presence of a lower rib flare indicating poor anterior core control and the diaphragm stuck more in the inhalation posture? Is their hand internally rotated more compared to the contralateral side? Observe the space between the resting arms of their side and their body. More visual space is indicative of a tight QL, tie side bending their trunk more to that side. Drop a plumb line down through the center of their body. Here you can appreciate the presence of a forward head posture from the side view. Are their shoulders downwardly sloped? Are their scaps anteriorly tilted when looking from the side? Is their humerus resting in extension, indicating a possible tight lat or related to their anteriorly tilted scap position? And from the back view, mark off the inferior and superior angles of the scapulas. Are they already starting in a downwardly rotated scap position? This is an MLB picture I saw for a second opinion five months after his TOS surgery and was having difficulty with throwing past 90 feet. Besides throwing, I asked him what other positions bothered him. He reported resting his hands on his hips and reaching out forward across the kitchen table to grab his drink as two provo provocative movements for him that brought him paresthesia in his arm. I thought that was a little unusual and not your usual TOS subjective complaint. So I asked him to complete the provoking posture of resting his hands on the hips, comparing his unveiled side to his right side. 
So no wonder reaching forward with scapular protraction created his symptoms because of the obvious medial border of his scapula. This is indicative of a serratus anterior um, uh, dysfunction or a possible issue with the long thoracic nerve that innervates it. This guy had no business throwing a baseball until he was able to get better scap control. A standard active scap assessment should be conducted from the front, side, and back views with forward shoulder flexion and abduction. There's certainly value to having them complete several reps to see the effects of muscular fatigue on their movement. You could also have them hold light one to three pound dumbbells, which will load up the scapular dysfunction movement and make it easier to identify. Pay close attention at how they look on the return from overhead position. Remember, eccentric control is very important for optimal shoulder health. But don't be surprised when working with pitchers, you see some altered timing with upper rotation on their dominant arm. As shown in this study by the same authors uh, with the Rangers, it is not uncommon to see asymptomatic healthy pitchers present with a delay in timing of active upwards motion mechanics. The pitchers in this study demonstrate less active scapular rotation than position players at 60 and 90 degrees of elevation. Pay particular attention should be taken when palpating the scalenes. Uh, as Dr. Pearl had mentioned, uh, those patients with suspected neurogenic TOS, that particular area will be uh, very tender, suggesting irritation of the plexus. Check the AC joint, trace the clavicle laterally, just to complete your exam. Also take note of symptoms as reproduced by palpation over the coracoid process. Check the bicep tendon, uh, greater tuberosity, where the cuff inserts to complete the anterior lateral palpation portion of the exam. From the posterior side, you can palpate the upper traps, underneath it, supraspinatus, spine of the scap, infraspinatus, over to the posterior cuff, and finally it's over to the maybe teres and, and medial border of the scap to check your rhomboids and middle traps. The cervical rotation lateral flexion test is a way to assess for an elevated first rib. It involves maximum cervical rotation away from the symptomatic side and passively flexing forward as far as possible and absorbing the amount of motion. A 50% reduction in flexion motion is positive for an elevated first rib because an elevated first rib restricts motion at C7, thus limiting the amount of flexion. Another way to assess for the elevated first rib is through manual joint play assessment. Turning the athlete's head to the same side with a slight ipsilateral side bend to relax the upper traps. You can use your MCP joint of your pointer finger to assess the amount of joint play of the first rib and observe for the reproduction of pain symptoms. The direction for the manual therapy technique is towards the opposite ASIS, assessed compared to the opposite side. This is the modified ATSIS maneuver that Dr. Keith Meister uses a lot in his clinic when examining patients suspected of having TOS. He palpates the distal radial pulse at the wrist. The athlete is asked to turn his head to the opposite side when, while you bring their arms into horizontal abduction, ask them to rapidly open and close their hands to create muscle contractions in their forearm, then have them relax. Observe for blanching in the hand and a loss of a pulse, onset of paresthesia, tingling, numbness in their arm, uh, similar to the complaints, is highly suggestive of neurogenic TOS. You can then send the suspected TOS patient to Dr. Pearl for an ultrasound-guided anterior scaling block. It is designed, designed to relax the scalings, thus decreasing compression of the plexus. A reduction in the arm symptoms while playing catch or long toss within an hour after the injection confers a diagnosis of neurogenic TOS and can be prognostic for success with both rehab and after surgery if needed. So on lug venous and arterial TOS in which there's an immediate medical intervention um, of either anticoagulation or thrombolytic therapy uh, and an immediate need to jump right into surgery, neurogenic TOS almost always is sent for PT first. The only time a neurogenic patient might be scheduled for surgery instead of rehab after the diagnosis is made is they've been dealing with ref stubborn refractory symptoms for a long time, already failed a good six to eight week uh, TOS specific rehab, or there is a strong evidence of a cervical rib or anomalous bony rib causing structural compression. Despite rehab playing a big role in the management of this condition, there is very little published in the specific protocols in the literature. However, I was able to find a few articles dedicated to it during my lit review and was happy to find that their treatment philosophies supported my personal clinical experience. 
So here's a non-operative treatment approach. First off, you gotta shut them down from throwing. Depending on the severity of the symptoms, it could be four to six weeks off. You wanna educate them on proper posture and activity modification. The major focus of early treatment efforts should be on symptom reduction. Attempts to immediately correct postural or biomechanical abnormalities prior to efforts at pain control or pain relief could result in an increase in symptoms and should therefore be approached cautiously at the initial treatment stages. Meds may be prescribed to decrease the paresthesia arm pain. Recognize if the athlete is stressed out. Highly stressed individuals will keep excess muscular tension in their neck and upper traps. Relaxation training or possible referral to a peak performance mental health specialist or counselor could be helpful as an adjunct. Provide good manual soft tissue therapy to decrease um, muscular tension of the scalenes. Caution should be performed when stretching the scaling too aggressively. Should be done in a slow, gradual manner. The pectoral muscles are the second group of muscles that, that need to be stretched. The other muscles listed should also be worked on due to their global relationship with the upper cross syndrome. From an orthopedic manual therapist standpoint, joint mobs to any of the joints that could improve overhead reaching ability should be checked and attended to. These include the SC and AC joints to make the clavicle, to make sure the clavicle has a good accessory motion. Glenohumeral inferior joint glides and scapular mobs can also, can also help. Cervical OA joint flexion mobs to get the head out of subcranial extension, commonly seen in the forward head posture, and thoracic spine extension mobs to get them out of thoracic kyphosis posture, other key areas to address. Diaphragmatic breathing training is extremely important to address and probably the key to it all. The diaphragm has a huge influence on rib and trunk positioning and overall posture statically and dynamically with movement. It has both the respiratory and stability function. An average person breathes in excess of 20,000 times a day. And if they're not breathing correctly with their diaphragm, there are secondary muscles of respiration, such as your scalenes, SCM, levator, upper trap, pecs, will have to overwork to compensate. Increased muscular tension and usage of those muscles can, can entrap the plexus. It is very important to teach the patient how to breathe correctly using their diaphragm. This ties in closely to rib positioning, trunk and postural training, followed by active exercises with a particular emphasis on scapular strengthening based on your active scap movement assessment conducted earlier. PRI DNS technique works well here. Scaling and pec stretches can be in instructed as a home program. Supportive scapular taping can help with postural cueing. Nerve glides can also be deployed, however, proceed with caution, especially if they are in an already hyper painful state. You would treat them in this manner for approximately four weeks before you reintroduce training the rest of the body, such as your core and lower body. If cleared by the physician and feeling much better at about six to eight weeks, ramp them up with a well-designed interval throwing amount progression. It is important to keep up with the TOS-specific rehab principles to continue as a maintenance program. I believe training the diaphragm plays an important role in the treatment plan. This is a minor league pitcher that had neurogenic TOS surgery and came for a second opinion. I assessed his natural breathing tendencies supine and observed how he chose to get his oxygen in. I followed that up by asking him to raise his arms overhead. Notice the lower rib flare and his choice to elevate the entire rib cage using his secondary muscles of respiration. Also take note that when he raises his arms overhead, his ribs continue to flare even more, which causes him to go into lumbar lordosis due to a lack of anterior core control. This is a DNS technique to assess the diaphragm supine in a gravity minimized position. If he exhibits this abnormal pattern lying down, it only exacerbates in the standing athletic position against gravity. Within 30 minutes, I was able to teach him to keep his lower abdominals to engage eccentrically at a low level to decrease his rib flare while simultaneously being able to appropriately inhale using his diaphragm. He was subsequently able to create appropriate diaphragmatic 300, 360 degree core stability while raising his arms up overhead without creating a rib flare while still breathing. This demonstrates improved postural awareness of his anterior core control in the supine position and ended up being a huge part of his home exercise program. You wanna follow that up with active exercise and any verbal and tactile cueing that is necessary to teach him how to achieve the ideal movement pattern. Ask him to complete at home several times a day to retrain, ingrain a new motor pattern before challenging him in other positions. 
to manually stretch the, stretch the scalenes, place the hypothenar eminence over the clavicle first rib region and side bend their head away and rotate towards the same side. Proceed gently and hold the scalene stretch for 15 to 20 seconds and repeat three to four times. Pin and stretch techniques work well here to stretch out both pec minor and major. You can then follow that up by teaching the athlete to complete home, home stretches for the scaling and pecs throughout the day. So the success rate of PT alone can range between 30 and 60%, depending on which study you're reading. If the athlete cannot effectively throw after undergoing rehab, as I outlined earlier, it is time to circle back up with the vascular surgeon. The time and energy spent with a conservative approach is not wasted because after surgery, many of the same treatment principles will be deployed and there's already an established trust and relationship with the athlete and rehab provider. This will help with the patient compliance and help with post-op outcomes. The surgery for neurogenic TOS is usually a first rib resection surgery. And Dr. Pearl described it in his talk using his preferred method of using a supracolicular approach, which includes a scalenectomy. It also mentioned that sometimes a pec minor tenotomy decompression is included through, a, through an answer approach. Uh, be aware that nicotine smokers have a poor prognosis due to increased risk of scarring uh, of the plexus post-op. From a post-op rehab uh, uh, progression, it is considered, in my mind, a criterion-based progression and not always a time frame based progression. So when we did our lit review, um, uh, in the current research, there's really not a lot of reporting of post-op outcomes related to athletes, uh, especially in baseball pitchers. Um, this is the first study I wanted to highlight from the researchers at Stanford, published in 2014. They sought to determine the incidence and timing of competitive athletes to return to their prior level of performance after TOS treatment and surgery. It was a retrospective review between 2000 and 2012, and 41 total patients met the criteria. There were 27 athletes diagnosed and treated with neurogenic TOS. Their definition of return to full athletic activity was return to prior level of function. They sent all patients first through a TOS specific rehab program. And if there was an improvement, they actually offered those surg the surgery option to those athletes with the philosophy that if they improved with rehab, dedicated decompressed the anatomical entrapment points, they would respond positively to the surgery that was designed as a decompression as well. It sounds a little counterintuitive uh, thought process, but uh, that, that probably goes against the grain than how most medical professionals would approach the problem, but that was what they ran with. 67% of the neurogenic TOS athletes that showed mild to moderate improvement with PT underwent surgery, and in that group, 83% returned to full competitive levels at an average of 4.6 months. As a side note, the neurogenic TOS cohorts, 32% uh, returned to sports ability with only receiving PT and not having surgery. Despite this study's promising post-op results and return to play in the athletic population, we have to be cautious in interpreting the results as it pertains to the players we work with in professional baseball. The athletes in the study were mixed. Only four subjects participated in baseball, which were in the neurogenic group, and, and it was not reported if any of them were at the professional level. So I won't go over, uh, you know, spend too long with the next study, the exact same studies that Dr. Pearl had one over in terms of midterm, long-term follow-up of, of uh, first rib resection. Um, but he, he indicated that 60% uh, uh, of the subjects were involved with either baseball or softball, but as to what level of play, it was not exactly reported, except that they ranged from high school to professional ranks. But overall, they found excellent long-term results from the survey. 70% returned to the same or better level of the athletic activity within the first year post-op. The younger athletes were more compliant with PT and returned to normal ADLs without limitation. They reported a trend towards younger athletes being more predicted to return to a prior level of competition a little quicker. And again, just like Dr. Pearl had mentioned, um, it was the 2017 study in which he and, and several vascu uh, prominent vascular surgeons in the United States participated in when they compared uh, pitching me metrics from pitch FX to, uh, to compare the impact of surgical treatment on neurogenic TOS and major league pitchers from 2001 to 2014, only 13 established pitchers met the criteria. Average age was 30, um, and 10 out of 13, or 77%, achieved the return to the major league level at 10.8 uh, uh, months post-op. The results showed no significant differences for 15 traditional pitching metrics, including ERA, WHIP, walks per nine innings, strikeout to walks ratio. No significant differences three years before or three years after. 
A limitation of the study is that there is only 13 pictures identified in this study. However, future research is needed in this area. Nonetheless, these three studies do provide some support that, uh, that surgical intervention for neurogenic TOS is helpful and that our athletes can come back to the same level of play and perform well. They can also provide us some expectation on timeframes on recovery and return to play. So here's the post-op first rib resection neurogenic TOS protocol. Don't be surprised if the athlete says they are sore in their upper back around the T1 vertebra because that is exactly where the first rib is attached near the transverse process. The supraclavicular incision is usually approximated with Dermabon and needs to be monitored from a wound care perspective. I'll usually provide palliative modality treatments for pain control and muscle guarding PRN and let the dust settle down, so to speak. Encourage immediate cervical scapular active range of motion exercises for the first two weeks. It is during this time period that you do postural education for anti upper cross syndrome. Ideas such as supine foam roll pec stretches while breathing foam roll to the lats and teres, lac lacrosse ball and wall pin and stretch pec minor are all good options for self myofascial program. They can benefit from some good manual therapy, soft tissue work. You can provide maintenance passive range work to the throwing shoulder and shoulder elevation, external and internal rotation at 90 as tolerated so, so they don't get too stiff in their shoulder. The chin tuck with head lift exercise supine will let you train the deep cervical neck flexors you don't want the chin to jut forward, which indicates an overriding SEM muscle taking over. Diaphragmatic breathing and postural stability training exercises are highly appropriate at this phase of rehab. PRI DNS exercise help with this. One of the benefits of attempting rehab first prior to surgery is diaphragmatic training was already initiated and should be easier for them to execute due to a prior exposure to the concepts and training. Remember, the phrenic nerve is very close to the surgical site and is usually protected during the procedure. The phrenic nerve innervates the diaphragm. The goal is to restore pulmonary status and return their forced vital capacity to normal limits, which is about 3,000 plus cc. Multi-angle shoulder isometrics or rhythmic staves can be incorporated in supine at this time to prevent disused atrophy of the important rotator cuff muscles. Post-op week three, they should have full cervical range of motion without issues. This is where scar massage and myofascial work to the anterior neck is initiated if there is full wound closure. You can start with fascial stretching of the neck with active cervical range of motion. Proceed with nerve glides cautiously. Initiate limb weight, shoulder and scapular strengthening and allow for walking or light stationary cycling for cardio while monitoring and limiting secondary accessory muscle breathing patterns. This illustrates a post-op TOS picture I had that exhibited restrictions in the Simpson's fascia area post-op. So it very, it's very important to do regular scar, scar tissue massage and myofascial work. Recurrence of neurogenic TOS can occur due to re-scarring around the plexus if not attended to on a regular basis. Post-op week four is where you can progress with your thrower's 10, Job's, Kibler type strengthening exercises. Thoracic spine mobility exercises such as sideline open book, bench T-spine mobs, peanut thoracic spine extension mobs uh, are all good, good options. Challenge their core with diaphragmatic and stability training. I can't emphasize enough to be aware of their head and neck position with traditional shoulder dumbbell exercises. The jutting forward of the head during their shoulder dumbbell program should not be tolerated and is evidence of a poor compensation pattern. We need to coach them better. Also at four weeks post-op, introduce a lower body strengthening program. Start body weight first and progress as tolerated. Remember that lower body exercises can impact upper body function. For example, if they are, they are in serious scapular depression or downward rotation, it might be a good idea to leave out heavy deadlifts, farmer walks, heavy walking dumbbell lunges for a bit. As a load in the hands, uh, could potentially drive the athletes into a more depression or downward rotation. For an example of how you could progress diaphragm stability core training, provide a biofeedback tool by placing a belt underneath their lumbar spine with a 10 pound weight hanging over the table. You wanna to try to position the belt around the L2 to L4 area where the lumbar lordosis would be. Challenge them by having them hold their legs up and in the 90-90 position which will challenge their ability to maintain good diaphragmatic stability without losing their lumbar lordosis. If the weight falls to the floor, they lost their diaphragmatic core control. 
you can add external loads to the upper extremity for overhead reaches, chops, and side-to-side -side motions to further challenge them. Here in these videos, there is 15 pounds of water in the PVC slosh pipe, creating perturbations. Supine protraction is a good starting point for serratus anterior strengthening work. Don't underestimate how a simple serratus wall press can be, a challenging, can be challenging for these type of patients. The guy in the middle is having a heck of a time with wall protraction as he continuously dives into scap retraction and elevation. Serratus wall slides is the next progression of challenging upper rotation motion of the scapulas on the rib cage. If they have mastered that, add band resistance around the wrists. This is the prone serratus ball push. Ask the athlete to maintain pressure down into the ball eccentrically while learning to inhale into his posterior medial steinum of his thorax. Complete five good breaths and full exhales while pushing into the ball the entire time. This is a good way to engage serratus anterior in a closed chain, low level method incorporating a breathing component. Post-op week five and on is when the progression of the athlete could deviate from a strict cookbook approach and may di diverge in terms of speed of progression based on healing of the nerves. This is where the progression becomes more criterion based. This is where clinical judgment comes into play to determine if the athlete is ready to progress through these progressions. Some can handle it earlier, while others may take longer to, pro to progress through them. The all four belly lift can progress serratus anterior strengthening. The athlete is now having to fully support his own body weight and control scapular protraction. Bear crawls and inchworms are fantastic anterior core challenges that also help to optimize scapular control and shoulder range of motion. Dolphin yoga style pose with the hips elevated up can effectively target upper rotation muscle fiber recruitment of serratus anterior. Bilateral serratus dynamic hug shown in the top left video. Unilateral door jam serratus upward slides in the top right video. Supine kettlebell bottoms up stability holds with the opposite lower trunk rotation as shown in the lower left video or lower trap seated depression with abdominals engagement in the lower right video are all examples of higher level scapular strengthening exercises. Progress the shoulder manuals and if possible, try to challenge the diaphragmatic core while doing so. The next progression would be to put the athlete in the provocative overhead 90-90 position and then have them do their one arm plyometric throwing progression. This is a functional test that they must pass without reproduction of their TOS symptoms before progressing with the throwing program. Quarter clock wall dribbles, D cells, and overhead body blade are the next progression. This is the time frame in which to, to employ to continually challenge the overhead position after the decompression surgery. At eight to 12 uh, plus weeks post-op, the athlete should have full pain-free range of motion of the neck and shoulder. Um, neck and shoulder, no symptoms with overhead rehab progression, negative clinical exam and full shoulder strength and scapular function and achieve 70 to 75% of prior lower extremity power as compared to spring training baseline numbers. This could be documented using force plates or velocity based training devices with the strength conditioning department. Finally, you should have a physician approval before starting two to three month interval throwing program that leads into a two to three month interval mountain program. So takeaways, prompt recognition and treatment prevents long-term issues and provides the greatest opportunity for optimal re recovery. Scar massage and soft tissue management is very important. Appreciate the importance of breathing patterns and the diaphragm. All scapular presentations are slightly different. Assessment guides treatment. The first three weeks post-op is standard, but after that point, speed of the progression can vary and is highly individualized. Don't rush. Thank you for your time and attention. I apologize for running a little over my allotted time. Thanks, Regan. That was great. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on uh, to Sue Falsoni. Uh, Sue Falsoni um, leads the league in number of initials after her name. Um, she is the owner and founder of Structure and Function Education. Um, she got her Bachelor of Science in Physical Therapy from Damon College. 
Master of Science uh, at UNC Chapel Hill, a board certified specialist in sports uh, physical therapy through the APTA, certified athletic trainer, certified strength and conditioning specialist, certified orthopedic manual physical therapist in spine through the IAOM. And on the weekends, she's a registered yoga teacher, so she does it all. Uh, she was previously the head of athletic training and sports performance uh, with U.S. Soccer Men's National Team. Uh, she's a previous head tra athletic trainer and physical therapist for Los Angeles, Los Angeles Dodgers. She is the first female head athletic trainer in any of the four major sports, sports in the United States. Now, it's quite, an, quite a thing. Uh, she's previously the vice president of performance physical therapy, uh, previously known as a API, now EXOS. Uh, she's the owner and founder of Structure and Function, which is an in-person uh, in online course uh, surrounding dry needling. Um, and um, she's authored many articles, but uh, she is the author of the best-selling uh, book on bridging the gap from rehab to performance. Uh, very good book. Um, and this is Sue and her mother, Louise, and her uh, brother, uh, Mark, and uh, her dog. <laughs> All right, there you go, Sue. Awesome. Walter, Walter, Walter. <laughs> Richard, Richard. Richard, so we sorry. Have our name Richard. Hang I on will just a second. put that together. All right. Sorry, I got that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> You're great. Um, thanks so much for having me on, Stan. Um, Stan and I go way back, uh, and he is the reason I got that esteemed title of the first female. So can't thank him enough for the impact he's had on my life and for including me in this awesome um, webinar. And thanks for Nancy for helping on the tech side for sure. Uh, we are going to shift gears a bit um, and talk about alternative conservative treatments. Um, this is gonna be an interesting talk because it's, um, it's gonna be super science-based, uh, but probably not crazy, crazy research-based. You can imagine the lit review for thoracic outlet syndrome is not a gigantic lit review. So you start combining um, thoracic outlet syndrome with acupuncture or dry needling or cupping or yoga. You can imagine that things just sort of decrease from there. So um, I'm going to give you a lot of information, um, kind of go, like I said, in a little bit different direction. But yeah, if you are that person who absolutely needs and loves double blind uh, randomized controlled trials, you are not going to love all the information I have to share. Um, so disclosures I do on structure and function education, uh, which is an education company. We do teach needling and cupping and things of the sorts. I am a Nike performance council member, do a lot of work for Nike, um, and have a bunch of books and DVDs and whatnot through on target. So those are my disclosures. Um, I want to start off by kind of talking about tools versus philosophies, because people love to argue about tools and what the best tool is. Um, and there is no best tool, right? A tool, a hammer is only as good as the carpenter who is holding that hammer, right? And someone who utilizes a tool um, just uses that tool to express their philosophy. My rehab philosophy can be summarized in one sentence. It's to restore and maintain the homeostatic balance of my patient. That's it. So whether I'm talking about a biomechanical effect, a biochemical effect, a bioneuro effect, a biopsychosocial effect, um, it doesn't matter. My philosophy is unwavering to restore and maintain the homeostatic balance of my patient. Whatever tool I choose to use to express my philosophy is just the tool that I use. So I can utilize a needle. I can utilize a kettlebell. I can utilize my hands, kinesiology tape. It doesn't matter. It's dependent on the person who is sitting in front of me um, and their anatomy and the situation and in season versus off season and sort of all of those different things. So I'm gonna talk about some tools that I feel that are very valuable in my clinical practice. Um, and Do you mind sharing your screen so we can see your PowerPoint? It's still not shared? Sorry, I totally thought I shared that. Let's try again. All right, let's try this again. There we go, it's starting. That better? Yep, just go ahead and press full screen and you'll be all set. Awesome, cool. Well, well luckily we only have one fun slide um, about tools versus philosophy. So we're good? Yes, you're all set. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so again, like just kind of keep in mind, we're gonna talk about some interesting tools today and how I might apply those tools in these situations, but you know, don't attach yourself too much to the actual tool. 
um, whenever people start to ask me about certain tools like needles, um, I always ask them to start with why. When people ask me, can you needle for a certain diagnosis? Um, my first question or my first statement is typically, well, just because usually yes, the answer is yes, you can needle something. However, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. And then my follow up question to that is why do you want to needle somebody or why do you want to cup somebody or why do you want um, to do instrument assisted with somebody? Always start with why. And if you can answer that question on why you want to utilize that tool with that person, I think it can be a very appropriate exercise and an appropriate tool. I think every clinician knows what they what they want to do in general. Um, I think good clinicians know how they can manipulate a tool, right? Like we can progress an exercise program or we could put the needles in a different place or we could put the tape on a different spot. So we know how to manipulate, but a great clinician always goes back to why. And they can give, you can give an anatomical or physiological reason on why you're utilizing a certain tool. And I think that's really important to be able to do. So for me, why would we want to utilize some things that may be not crazily specifically um, supported in the literature for a specific diagnosis? Well, I always ask myself, is there a physiological basis to what I'm doing? Um, and specifically, as we're talking about thoracic outlet syndrome, why would we want to use some of these other things? Well, we've already heard this is an extremely complex diagnosis. Lots of different moving parts. Lots of different things are happening. Um, and so we may want to have more than one tool in our toolbox in order to help somebody get to the other side of this. So I think when we start to think about alternative therapies in general, um, you know, why would I want to use those things? I think from a local treatment of soft tissue, what locally could I affect with a certain tool? How can I manage my patient's pain, which I think pain management is a really important thing to do. And then how can I balance the autonomic nervous system in order to help with this diagnosis, specifically thoracic outlet syndrome? And we heard Regan talk quite a bit about breathing and posture and all of those sorts of things. And, and we know that the autonomic nervous system can definitely play a role in how people are breathing and the postures that they hold. So to me, as I was thinking about this diagnosis and my experience with it, um, these are, are the three things that I always go back to. So um, like I said, if you're looking for um, really high level research to sort of back up some of these treatment methods, you're not going to find them. You're going to find a bunch of case studies though, which is really interesting. And we're going to talk about um, most of these as we get going. But lots of different case studies. And, you know, I'm a big fan of the case study. I think that that we can find out a lot of information about different things through case studies and case series. You know, I, I primarily deal with professional athletes and it's just not very common to see um, randomized controlled trials in seven foot tall basketball players. So, you know, we have to do the best we can with the best available research. And unfortunately, sometimes the best or fortunately, the best available research we have are case studies. So um, I think we have to, to acknowledge that it is a form of research. And um, while it may be a bit limited and have its limitations, it's certainly valuable and can help us in very, very specific cases. So let's kind of look at how we can utilize different therapies for local treatment of soft tissue. Um, as um, Dr. Pearl had already talked about, these are the three main areas of compression that we see in thoracic outlet syndrome at the interscaling space, the costoclavicular space, and the retropectoralis space. These are our most common areas. And so certainly, I'm not saying that I don't do anything that, that Regan talked about. Of course I do. I do everything that he talked about from all the postural exercises and, and all of the different breathing things. But we can also add in some other potential alternative, um, alternative considerations. So I'm going to kind of scrub. This is a 16-minute long video, which I won't have you watch but you know from a needling standpoint the biggest thing is being able to identify your anatomy and so um the the great thing about needling is it forces you to be amazing with your anatomy you don't want to start sticking needles in people if you're unsure of the anatomy and i don't just mean musculoskeletal anatomy you've got to know where lungs are and where veins are and where arteries are and where borders of muscles are. And so once you sort of know exactly where you are and we respect what's happening from a patient anatomical standpoint, we can select an appropriate intervention. So all I'm doing here, just from an instruction standpoint, is mapping out where
where that SCM is, where the sternal portion of the SCM is, the clavicular portion, the upper trapezius, the clavicle, um, and identifying where the external jugular vein is. We don't want to needle the external jugular vein. Um, we want to be able to identify the anterior triangle, which hopefully you can see my little pointer. That's the anterior triangle. All the scary stuff lives up in here. The posterior triangle, which I'm blocking, or actually it's right here now that I move my hand, the posterior triangle, when you look at the anatomy of it, there's a whole bunch of muscle stuff that lives back there. Levator, anterior scalenes, middle scalenes, um, um, splenius capitis, right? Like a whole bunch of different muscles that we can access with a needle as long as we are actually in the cervical spine. We need to make sure we are, are above the supraclavicular area. We don't want to interfere obviously with the apex of the lung that can certainly sit right there. So once we identify and we know where we're going, we identify where the scary thing lives, we identify where the safe things are, we certainly can um, needle some of these structures. Now, why we would needle some of these structures, definitely evidence to show local and biomechanical effects. When I put a needle into somebody and I begin to either wind or do a little bit of needle manipulation with them, winding specifically, some evidence to show up to four centimeters of tissue deformation away from where I have the needle. Four centimeters is quite a lot. And when you start talking about scar tissue and collagen deformation, that can be quite a, a huge distance. We know that there are some local effects there. We also know that every time we stick a needle into someone, we are stimulating um, a, a local healing response. It's exactly what needling is. is it's a self-healing therapy. So here I'm just identifying the sternocleidomastoid. I'm making sure that I avoid the external jugular vein. We are using an extremely short needle in an extremely safe manner um, based on her anatomy in order to put a needle into that SCM, come back out. And we're just gonna immediately decrease the tone. We may or may not get a trigger point. I am certainly not attached to trigger points in my dry needling practice. Uh, but you may or may not get a muscle twitch and, and can kind of help make those muscles relax. Um, so that is SCM as we kind of continue to move into the video. You'll see me kind of pointing out some of the scaling. So again, once we know where that posterior triangle is, I can have the patient rotate her head. If I have her rotate her head away from me, the transverse processes are actually going to come more superficial. So I can actually palpate where the transverse processes are, Again, scary stuff lives in front of the transverse process. Muscular attachments are behind the transverse processes. So once I kind of identify where those transverse processes are, I can aim the needle to the scaling attachments on the cervical spine um, and really safely sort of decrease tension in that area, help with pain management from a local standpoint, um, as well as, um, yeah, just kind of decrease some of the muscular tension in that area. So there we are just looking at more of the anatomy. And again, palpating and knowing exactly where I am. Needling makes you fantastic at your anatomy. If you don't know your anatomy, you shouldn't be sticking needles in people. So nice and safe when we um, identify that's exactly where the needle would go, right behind the transverse process on the attachment of the scalenes, levator, splenius capitis, et cetera. So, Okay, so then as we continue to kind of look at the research, so here's one, again, a case report on where these people utilize dry needling um, for someone with thoracic outlet syndrome, 45 or 46 year old man had five sessions of dry needling in conjunction with therapeutic exercise. And I think that's a huge point. It is a rare day when all I do is needle somebody. Needling provides me a window of opportunity to change someone's movement patterns. And that's where the power of needling really comes into play. If you change an afferent input, you are absolutely going to change an efferent output. That's how the neuromusculoskeletal system works. So sometimes needling can provide us with just a novel neurological stimulus that alters the afferent input into the central nervous system and therefore changes the motor output. So even though maybe these are not areas that I personally and clinically would have gone to, I don't think these people made a wrong choice. They, they certainly had a great result. The patient's numbness disappeared. Their VAS scale dropped down to a one. Their sleep quality improved by 80%. That's all fantastic stuff. So when you look at needling, upper trapezius, cervical paraspinals, rotator cuff, um, you know, supraspinatus, 
that might just have given enough novel stimulus into those muscles in order for them to be activated better. And now you can do scapular stabilization type things or scapular activation things, rotator cuff stuff, um, allowing you to sort of lengthen actively the anterior structures while you activate the posterior structures. So I certainly think it's something to think about and something to consider. As we continue kind of looking at some of these case studies, this case study was very interesting. It utilized cup therapy in the treatment of thoracic outlet syndrome for a collegiate pitcher. Um, so basically the, the kid was experiencing swelling in the middle phalanx. They ruled out thrombosis, they ruled out cervical ribs, they ruled out everything um, kind of crazy. So they decided to initiate some cupping therapy with this person. And so here's from you know what they did. They just did some static, static techniques right at the subclavius, kind of right underneath the clavicle there on the left-hand side of that picture. And they did some static cupping techniques to the upper trapezius. And we're gonna see some ultrasound pictures here in a second that will show you some decompression and kind of what happens under the cup when we do a, a static static technique. After a few sessions, they also began doing a dynamic static technique where they took the cup and they actually moved it along the SCN and got some decompression to the area. So they added that after about one week. Um, and after about three weeks, um, the, the client had an improved in his shoulder, improvement in shoulder range of motion, improvement in his scapular um, kinematics. He was able to return to pitching for the rest of the season without a reoccurrence of symptoms. That's fantastic. I, I think that that is an interesting case study for us to start to consider. Maybe in certain cases, um, you know, cupping might be an appropriate thing to try on some of these areas. So, you know, again, other places where I would probably cup would be more in the pectoralis area as well. Um, and so Brian here is just demonstrating a dynamic static technique, so a dynamic cup on a static body, and he is cupping the entire pectoralis region. And so we'll see that from a different angle, um, but hopefully when we were at the other angle, you can see how that tissue gets lifted up into the cup. Brian is also lifting there, so he's not doing a ton of compression. He's lifting that tissue up and getting some potential decompression here. So when we look at these different techniques, a static cup on a static body or a dynamic cup on a static body, and then one I'm not going to show, which is a static cup on a dynamic body, we utilize these techniques for different reasons. And the static static technique that that cupping article showed us um, is interesting. Now, I, this is a quad, so I'm not saying we can extrapolate what's happening to the quad to the upper trapezius. We're actually looking at what at this exact study um, at the upper trapezius at Boston University right now, which is interesting. So hopefully we can report that data soon. Um, this is just a pilot study that we started to do in the lab. And so with a, just a 30 millimeter cup on a static static, the picture on the left here um, is pre-treatment. And then this was immediately after um, a, a 30 millimeter cup was in place just for, just for several minutes. Um, and we actually see a decompression. So we can see here um, at the vastus intermedius, we went from one centimeters to 1.2 centimeters at the rectus from 1.2 to a 1.33, at the subcutaneous tissue, a 0.76 to a 0.94, so almost 0.2 centimeters of a decompression at each layer of the tissue. Now, what does that mean? I have no idea, um, but we're starting to try to figure it out. We're starting to look at this, um, and we're trying to figure out, okay, what does that decompression mean? How does that relate to people's symptoms? How long does that decompression last? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, we, we just don't know, but I think it's interesting that we're starting to get some of this cupping research underway. We also started to look um, in the lab at just some elastography stuff. So elastography is really interesting for, for, um, from a cupping perspective. So um, elastography, the more red you have, the less stiff the tissue is. So more red equals less stiff. So again, same thing over here, the tissue, the subcutaneous tissue has less stiffness. When the cup is in place, we get a decrease in stiffness in the subcutaneous layers. 
Now, again, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. I think when we're talking about power development and strength and conditioning, decreasing someone's stiffness might not be a great thing because they're, they, you need to be a little bit stiff in order to transmit force. But when we're talking about pain relief and pain management, decreasing stiffness might be a really good thing. I'm not really sure, but there is a difference when we're putting cups on people. And again, we're continuing to explore this in the lab, which is kind of nice. Um, and then, oh, let me go back. Actually, don't look at those. Hopefully, oh, these were videos that are not going to play. But same thing with the dynamic movement, you are actually going to see um, um, a change in the stiffness of the tissue as well. So as we look at like pain management type stuff, we have to understand that all pain is not created equal. Um, people who are in an inflammatory state of pain it, it need totally different management than people who are in a nociceptive state of pain, meaning a delta fiber, C fibers are being stimulated um, and we can maybe utilize concepts of gait theory in order to manage someone's pain by stimulating an A beta fiber. Um, neuropathic pain is when there's an actual neurological lesion um, whether that would be peripheral or central. Um, and then nociplastic is really kind of the term we're utilizing to substitute chronic pain um, because chronic pain kind of implicates a time standpoint and nociplastic really is more about a change in the perception of the central nervous system of pain. So we know people can be in pain without nociceptive stimulation. And so utilizing the term nociplastic to really talk about a change in centralization or the underlying mechanisms of how pain is managed um, is important. So the reason I bring this up is because we have to recognize in pain management, which I think is extremely important as a healthcare practitioner, um, that all pain is not created equal. And so I have to determine, is my patient in pain which section of pain, right, of these four things are they in? And then again, I can select my modalities or my treatment interventions more appropriately because I would treat all four of these patients totally differently. So don't let this slide scare you. We could spend 30 minutes just talking about this slide and what dry needling does on a physiological level. I just want to focus on this concept of pain control. So this red arrow here on the left is more presynaptic inhibition of pain. On the right, more postsynaptic inhibition of pain. So over here on the left, if we kind of equate this as like, um, if we had 10 catchers, 10 pitchers, and every time a catcher caught a ball, it equated to one point on the VAS scale, right? So if you have 10 catchers, 10 pitchers, 10 balls are caught, someone's in 10 out of 10 pain, awesome. We can manage someone's pain by decreasing how many balls are thrown. So if we only give five pitchers, five baseballs, that means only five catchers can catch five baseballs. So that means someone is in less pain. That would be a presynaptic inhibition of pain control. A lot of our modalities function off of this concept of presynaptic pain control inhibition. Things like kinesiology tape, ultrasound, laser, our manual therapy, all of these things that stimulate an A beta fiber function off of this first order neuron management of pain. When we start looking at postsynaptic management of pain, um, that would be like having 10 guys throw a baseball, but only five catchers catching the baseball. So less guys catch the ball. Um, and so again, we can manage people's pain here. So that's a postsynaptic inhibition of pain. And so um, not many of our clinical modalities affect postsynaptic pain control. Um, that's where drugs come into play. Drugs do a really nice job of managing pain uh, postsynaptically. And so the beauty of needling is that we really do for the kind of one of the first times from a, a clinical standpoint is we can utilize needles to manage pain presynaptically and postsynaptically. We can decrease the amount of neurotransmitters that um, are interpreted at the spinal cord for our pain signal, and we can decrease how many of those receptors are being activated on the other side. So um, yeah, I think that lots of different ways to manage pain, but to know clinically, the majority of our stuff manages things presynaptically. Needling gives us an opportunity to manage people's pain postsynaptically as well, which can be really, really powerful. Um, and that's why pain controlling drugs work really, really well, um, or one of the reasons they work well. Um, and then finally, um, balancing the autonomic nervous system, I think is absolutely huge. We know that when people are in a sympathetic state, 
um, that they are, they have an increase in their heart rate. They have an increase in their breathing rate. Their pupils dilate because you're trying to see the enemy, right? You need to prepare for battle or you need to figure out how to run. So um, the sympathetic state was never meant to be lived in. We're meant to live in the parasympathetic state state where we are resting and we're digesting and our heart rate is slower and our respiratory rate is slower and we can sleep and we digest food better. And so that's the state we're supposed to be living in. The problem now is that, you know, given computers and lights and our, our crazy, um, our, our crazy uh, lifestyles, we tend to live in the sympathetic. And so if someone's increasing their respiratory rate, think about when you just get done running a sprint and how um, much of an apical breath you have. Um, absolutely, you have to have an apical breath when your respiratory rate increases because you need to take more breaths per minute because you're not breathing as deeply. So um, everything that we heard Regan talk about um, from a uh, apical breathing pattern and diaphragmatic breath strategy relates to this concept of autonomic nervous system balance. And so I think things like yoga and meditation are something that can tap us into a parasympathetic state. And when we look at the research on meditation and specifically the yogic breath um, and why a yogic breath or meditation can help throw somebody into a more parasympathetic state, it's because of the cranial nerve. And when we look at the cranial nerve, right, the vagus nerve, uh, cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, right, the vagrant, it's a wanderer, it goes all over the place, it's the longest nerve we have in the body body, it has to pierce the diaphragm in order to get down to the gut. Now, it doesn't innervate the diaphragm, but it has to pierce the diaphragm, which means if I do diaphragmatic, slow, deep breathing, and I get that diaphragm really moving and contracting, I'm going to stimulate the vagus nerve. If I stimulate the vagus nerve, I'm going to go into a parasympathetic state because this nerve is primarily parasympathetic. And so looking at anatomy um, allows us to kind of say, okay, how can we do this? We can do that through deep breath work. We can do that through um, visceral work. So whether that's through abdominal massage or visceral manipulation um, or some of these other things to kind of just improve the motility of our guts, decrease the adhesions. You know, I was definitely a skeptic of visceral manipulation type things as well until you start to kind of just think about the abs and visceral manipulation as being fascial manipulation for the uh, peritoneum cavity and, and the, th the thoracic cavity and the retroperitoneal cavity. Our organs are suspended in our bodies through fascia. So if we think fascial manipulation or fascial work of any sort is important in our back and in our extremities, then why would we be afraid of the abdomen? And why would we think that fascial restrictions couldn't be present um, in between the organs and, and in between our abdominals and therefore bind down our diaphragm, maybe decrease its ability to actually have a fantastic contraction, which decreases its ability to stimulate the vagus nerve, which decreases or inhibits our ability to, to kind of go into a parasympathetic state. So I think these are some things that we at least have to consider when we're talking about doing some of the, the breath strategies that, that Regan talked about. Um, and then finally, too, from a, another needling standpoint, needling, um, especially near big, long nerves, can stimulate this pathway called the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. When we insert needles into somebody, we get a release of acetylcholine, especially when we're near nerves. And so the acetylcholine is a primary um, parasympathetic neurotransmitter. So if we can get a release of acetylcholine, and again, another way to stimulate the vagus nerve, we can tap into the parasympathetic nervous system, balance somebody out a little bit, change their breathing strategy, and potentially have the ability to change their symptomology. Um, so specifically, as we're more in the spine, where we're near some of these nerves, um, we can get a really, really big response of what I'm talking about. And so when I do paraspinal needling or this protocol that's a little bit more on the right with my patients, um, you will see an immediate change in their breath and it becomes slower, it becomes deeper, it becomes way more diaphragmatic and way less apical. And they get up off the table feeling like they wanna to go to sleep. A lot of times they fall asleep on the table with me. So um, we're definitely tapping into that parasympathetic uh, portion of the autonomic nervous system, depending on where I place my needle and what I do with the needle. So again, another consideration. So just kind of stuff to think about, right? When we're looking at it from a 
uh, research standpoint, again, the research is pretty limited when it comes to thoracic outlet syndrome as a whole. Thoracic outlet syndrome management, um, again, is a bit limited in the research, but we're learning and we're studying and then thinking about how these other therapies might impact local treatments, pain management, and autonomic nervous system balance, I think are things to kind of consider um, when we're talking about um, sign and symptom management um, in, in patients with this diagnosis. So that is it. Thank you so much um, for allowing me to, to participate. I know we've got a, a fun Q&A coming up. Yep, Sue, um, great. Uh, what I like about Sue and why I like her on, on the programs is she takes something that think is, you think is unscientific and she makes it scientific. Uh, she also has the uh, ability to say things like, why does this work? I have no idea, but we're trying to find out. And I think that uh, that shows a lot in regards to this. And we're seeing a lot more of these type of modalities, if they're called modalities, uh, working uh, and doing these, these things. Um, really quickly, I just want to give the poll uh, that came on um, that we had and give, give the results. Um, this is on the average number of patients you see. 25% uh, had never seen a, a TOS, uh, one per year, 56%, which is the, the, the amount, 2% uh, two per year at 13% and greater than two at 6%. The reason I think this is an important one is that uh, we see in the literature really low sample sizes in regards to the, to the uh, TOS literature, yet it's out there. It's out there. And the old adage of we don't see it, but it sees us. So it's kind of interesting that uh, in professional baseball, um, we haven't done really great epidemiological studies and we really need to take this to the hit system um, on the EMR system and, and start looking at, at, at this. Uh, so, uh, uh, and this was just about who's on, on the, on the uh, call, professionals 56%, college is 37. Um, in looking at this, 65% has at least seen and treated a thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, and uh, we haven't talked too much about the Ipsum, but I'm going to bring this up in the, in the, the Q&A um, about uh, what causes the Ips, which we don't know where it goes and where it comes from. Uh, but 66% uh, felt it was a mental block. Only 12% thought it was thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, so uh, uh, that's just interesting to me. And might be interesting to you, I don't know. But uh, so um, let's, we'll go to the Q&A. Uh, we have a lot of questions. There's been a lot of questions on here. Nancy Patter, uh, Patterson Flynn, I'm sorry, she's always Nancy Patterson to me. Nancy, Nancy Flynn's gonna ask some of the questions uh, that you've put on the Q&A. All right, first up, from a clinical exam point, we know that the diagnosis accuracy of the Ruse, Adsons, Allen's tests are not very high perhaps because they focus more on vascular TOS reproduction. In your experience, which tests are most helpful for neurogenic TOS and which aggregation of clinical tests have the greatest diagnosis ac accuracy? Uh, I think Dr. Pearl and then maybe sure. Regan on this one. Uh, you know, that's true. The, the, the roos national maneuvers that are just demonstrating uh, provocative or positional related compression of the artery is purely an adjunctive supportive kind of a maneuver. It is not absolute diagnostic in any way, shape or form. And in, in the patient that has, again, the appropriate clinical constellation of symptoms, other appropriate physical findings, uh, and, you, and they do demonstrate positional related compression of the artery, again, it's supportive of the diagnosis, certainly not diagnostic. I think the most important thing in these patients is, is a, a, good, a good history. I mean, if you really cut through it with the neurogenic patients, they're all basically telling you the same thing. I've got pain and tightness in my neck, my upper back, periclavicular, it feels like I'm pulling all the time. Just feel like I just can't get it relaxed. I'm getting numbness tingling in my arm and hand, um, especially when I'm you know, trying to grasp something, open a door, knob, reach behind me, reach overhead, and women always complain about doing their hair or putting on their makeup, that their arm gets heavy and fatigued. It's, again, they're really telling you very much uh, the same story with the same same symptoms. So that I think that's by far and away the most important thing. 
again, they've got very consistent um, reproducible stories. Um, and then again, I think I think I mentioned in my talk, and I think uh, Reagan mentioned as well that that almost all of them, I, mean, I, I get nervous and really, really question the diagnosis. If they have no tenderness over the scaling triangle um, or over the, over the pec, um, I think it's certainly not unequivocally not TOS, but it really, really makes me question it because almost all the patients are, are tender from the, a little bit of plexitis and a little bit of the muscular tightness and inflammation. They're just tender up there. So I think that's the most reliable thing uh, along with the, again, the appropriate clinical constellation symptoms. Regan, what, what do you think on that? Yeah, I, I really don't have much more to add to what Dr. Pearl had said. Like, I mean, it's out there in the literature. I don't know the exact specifics in terms of the sensitivity, specificity. I think it's, it is low for those tests individually. I think it, you use them collectively with a good subjective history, functional movement screen, uh, to try to reproduce their symptoms and then see if it makes sense from an anatomical standpoint and palpation, um, and then it just really kind of leads you down to that, to really consider that as a diagnosis. Yeah, um, I'm gonna kind of jump in here and, and ask a question in regards to, we, we always talk about TOS as a diagnosis of exclusion. When everything else fails, think about TOS. Um, and uh, in your study, Dr. Pearl, it showed that 3.9 years went by before anyone diagnosed TOS on the study that you did. Um, uh, that becomes a problem, uh, but again, because some of these uh, uh, symptoms are, are wavering and moving all over the place, uh, nobody thinks of that until sometimes it's too late. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, again, I think, especially with the high-performance athletes, they always, many of them have compounding things in their history or uh, other surgical procedures or other studies they had in the past that have shown, you know, some wear and tear in their shoulder or some, you know, inflammation or bursitis in the shoulder or some wear and tear in the elbow. And that's where a lot of the symptoms may be referred to. And, um, and again, it's the most common stuff, uh, stuff that you, you're looking for and, and uh, what is the cause of their issues in most of these athletes. Um, so that, that does delay things. Um, and so it's always, so, so by, again, I think I mentioned by the time I see these patients, they've always been, worked up to the max, they've had MRIs of their elbows, shoulders, they've had nerve tests, they've had MRI of their neck. Uh, many of them had, have had EMG nerve connection studies. So a lot of the diagnostic stuff has been done. And again, it's, you sometimes have to go through the, the, that exercise and, and get those studies to be sure it's not one of those other things that, that probably is more likely. Nancy? And there, there commonly is a lot of overlap, of course, in the symptomatology as well, sorry. Yep, no problem. Nancy? All right, for dry needling, I've heard conflicting things about when to do needling in relation to activities. Do you recommend doing dry needling before or after activities? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think um, it kind of depends on um, what type of needling that you're doing. So if I'm doing more of a, like, trying to be super parasympathetic with my client. Again, like I have a weird concierge practice, so I treat in people's homes. So I may go to a guy's house at night, do some parasympathetic needling, and then we don't do any exercise afterward because I want him to go to bed. Like that's the whole point is trying to get him to go to sleep. So depending on that protocol, I might not do any activity. Um, as opposed to if I'm doing more local type of symptomology or pain management type thing, I typically needle first, manual therapy second, exercise third, because I find that needles can be very diagnostic, meaning um, because it's such a it's afferent, such a, afferent it's, it's kind of a, a crazy a afferent crazy stimulus. stimulus. Um, sorry, there's an echo. Are you, are you guys hearing that too? Are you okay? Oh, you're good. Good. Um, so if I put a couple needles into somebody and they have an immediate change in their range of motion, like let's say I put one or two needles into somebody's pec and all of a sudden their anterior tilt is now completely gone and they've got full posterior scapular tilt, then that wasn't a, one of two things, right? Either needles are magic or it wasn't what I thought it was. And so chances are needles aren't magic. It was more of a neurological hold versus a structural hold. So by changing the afferent input into the system, I changed the position of the scapula. 
I abandon my manual therapy and I go right into a lot of posterior chain therapeutic exercise type things to try to activate posteriorly. Um, versus if I put a couple needles in someone's pec, there is no change. Well, then maybe I have a mechanical issue that I want to do manual therapy or instrument assisted or some other kind of local biomechanical things, manual therapy wise in the area before I go to therapeutic exercise. So um, yeah, that's, that's how I utilize it. Great. Nancy, another question from the group. Okay. Would you consider conservative treatments such as rehab and or Botox injections prior to surgical intervention? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, with the, the, the physical therapy rehab stuff, um, you know, I, I've got a very simple mind and I mean, all I'm doing <laughs> is I'm basically going in and removing compressive structures to allow the nerve artery and vein to pass through uh, a passageway unencumbered. So it's not getting pinched and irritated. There are so many other things that get drawn in associated with, with the, the symptoms that arise from the compression directly related to the compression of the neurovascular structures. And that's why I always tell the patients, you know, all this, the, the pot, and I just kind of refer to everything that Reagan and Sue, Sue have talked about as sort of postural related corrective sort of things. And I always tell the patients for neurogenic stuff, all that stuff trumps surgery any day of the week. I can do the best operation in the world, but if you don't go, go through a good rehab, good diligence, supervised, rehab program with all the other adjunctive techniques that have been discussed, <clears throat> my surgery is going to fail. And I mean, I'm, I'm amazed at, uh, I see, I, I get referred to a lot of patients for reoperative problems, recurrent reoperative things. And I'm always amazed at the patients that have had surgery done elsewhere where it's done by somebody that doesn't do a lot of it, where they never had any therapy after surgery or before surgery. I said, are you kidding me? I mean, it's unbelievable. And the thing was doomed to fail without, without, a good comprehensive rehabilitative effort around the surgery before or after. But yeah, I always try, I always make sure the patients have had a attempt at a, a conservative non-operative measures first. Well, uh, I want to get, uh, I want to get to some of the other uh, questions real quick, but uh, um, I've got this thing about the yips. I, I, I want to know about the yips. We've all seen it. It's the most uh, fascinating process of destruction that I've ever seen and almost impossible to get rid of. It comes from nowhere. It goes away sometimes with nothing. Uh, many people uh, think that it's a proprioceptive problem by uh, secondary uh, loss of some sensation and proprioception uh, in uh, a thrower. Uh, and um, what are you, Regan, have you seen much of this? Uh, and then has anybody else seen it where uh, it just goes away, uh, which means was it not structural or was it mental? I mean, we saw that the huge number of people on the on the, on the uh, uh, poll thought that it was more of a mental issue than it was a physical or diagnostic issue. Yeah, I think first off, it's a it's probably not a very simple answer. It's probably very complicated because if you have the yips, you can't say that they have TOS. However, if they have TOS, they could have the yips. Um, you know, because the yips really is basically an inability to complete fine motor movement and to replicate the movement over and over again. So if you think about what movement is, it's really, it's really from the central nervous system and the CPU is really your, your brain. So I, I feel like you could have, like TOS could have para, uh, some paresthesias, some proprioceptive visions and so forth. They could have some yips, but I can't say from the other direction. It is, it is pr pretty analogous to like, even just speaking right now, it's like public speaking, like you could lock up, you could totally forget. And it's not because I have TOS, it's because I have an emotional or psychological, uh, the way I'm processing things and I, and I create a, a, a movement lockup. But how do, you, how do you explain someone who, and we've all seen it, someone who's been in the major leagues for six years, I can think of a catcher right now who then all of a sudden couldn't throw it back to the pitcher. All of a sudden, in one instant, couldn't do that. Uh, uh, Dr. Pearl, did you, you see people uh, who have the ips that come here and come to you and then do better afterwards? Is there anything that you can do, a cause and effect relationship with this, or is it just all, all over the place? Um. 
I can only, <clears throat> there's only really one major, uh, elite athlete I've, I've, I've done the surgery on that <clears throat> had the yips, and that was Salty back in the day, Jared Salamalakia. And, um, but in addition to the yips, I mean, he had a lot of the other symptoms as well and the appropriate findings and et cetera. But it, it's not a prominent uh, part of the, the typical presentation in, in my experience. I, I think, you know, they always complain of you know, difficulty with the, the feel for the ball, you know, the, the, the arm in space, release point, all that, all that kind of the fine motor stuff that Reagan's talking about. Loss of feel for the ball, difficult with pitch placement, but full-blown yips, uh, I've not really had to deal with that much. Yeah, if you put yourself in their shoes too, like you know, let's say you all of a sudden have lost command and there, there's a lot of influence from the external environment, your teammates, the fans and so forth. And then you go try to do it again and you can put yourself in their position and think like, hey, now you're worried about the negative outcome. And you start worrying about, in, you know, more intrinsic issues versus maybe there's this whole internal, external cueing that's going on in the coaching world. Maybe there's a factor to that too. Um, you know, so like there, I, I, I had read that in Australian rules football, potentially to improve place kickers, uh, you know, elite kickers, what will be have to be about 80% accurate. And so, so to help improve the accuracy, they'll put like a strike down the, the football so that they could start thinking about the external cue of creating as maximum spin that they can on that strike. So taking away an internal cue to more an external cue. So I'm not, there's no research on this, but maybe that's something that if they all of a sudden can't, they're starting to think about who's in the stands. If I got to throw a strike, if I don't, I'm going back down to the minors and, and so forth. So maybe that's a tool. You start putting strikes around baseballs and they start focusing on an external cue of like making revolutions of, of, of the ball so that it, it can try to work on command. Um, wow. I, I, it's, a, it's the damnedest thing I've ever seen. And I just wonder if, uh, it's a reason for referral to the vascular surgeon just to try to rule that out. But again, uh, it's such a myriad of, of symptoms. Uh, I don't know if you do that. Well, once there's the, since we've gone to doing more um, scaling blocks, uh, uh, if somebody had that and there was a question, you know, you could do a good anterior scaling muscle block and see if they, the yips go away or they feel better. Uh, I, sorry, I didn't comment on the, on the Botox. Um, it had really, really mixed results with Botox. And I, I think it's probably a combination of two things. Um, one, I think it's a volume issue. I think, you know, you, you, Botox is so expensive. I think you got to put put a pretty good amount uh, into the, the scaling and certainly into the pec minor to, to get enough effect to really block the, the shortening and the, spazzing, the spasm. And then there's also a lot of, as we talked about, fibrocartilaginous kind of banding and things like that to go along with the muscular belly kind of skeletal muscle kind of stuff so and I don't think the Botox would affect that as much plus the third thing is that many times when we're in there uh, doing the decompression we'll, we'll see some uh, uh, atypical insertion of the scaling to the rib where it, it may insert where it kind of wraps around or sort of scissors scissors around the plexus that really predisposes to the compression as well and, and um, those are some of the things I, uh, I think that would that factor into why Botox has been so inconsistent. Uh, Nancy? Uh, due to state and professional practice restrictions, have there been any positive findings using acupressure in similar manner as you do for dry needling? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think that um, there is a, a fair amount of research on acupressure. Um, certainly the point stimulation is, um, is can be the same. Um, there is something novel, though, with the invasive procedure of putting a needle in and creating that self-healing response. So um, yeah, I, I haven't looked at the literature comparing the outcomes of acupressure versus acupuncture um, or dry needling, but um, I think it's, it's worth, you know, it's worth a try and worst case scenario, if you just think of it as a form of, of fascial manipulation or soft tissue work at a specific point, then yeah, I think it's, it's, it's worth attempting for sure. Regan, um, you talked about scapular uh, dyskinesia in your, your talk. Uh, I find this very fascinating that, that the scapula in almost every talk that we have, no matter what the body part is, goes back to the scapula uh, as a key, key thing to this. Uh, um, 
seems like a great place to start on just about everything. Your thoughts on that? Absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, the scapula, uh, you know, as well as rib positioning in terms of like making sure you have those uh, functioning well, because if you, if you would say like the, the glenohumeral joint has to have a good foundation off the glenoid, the same could be true where the glenoid and scapula needs to have good position off the ribs. So um, if you just worked on that, you know, you probably would help just a lot of different pitchers with a lot of different, different diagnoses other than TOS as well. So it's a, it's a big mainstay just from a preventative standpoint. And it, it's, yeah. it's true in the post-operative rehabilitation phase as well. It's one of the things that we see downstream when the patients are still complaining of a lot of pain and tightness in their you know, trapped scap area. It's all due to residual scapular dysfunction and dyskinesis and things like that. And it's, uh, when you correct that, all that stuff goes away. So it's really important in the post-op period to work on the, the trapped scap, all the stuff that you know, y'all have been discussing. Well, there was a question um, uh, on the Q&A too, on pitchers versus position players. Do you see more pitchers? Uh, do you see more position players or it's about equal as we go along from a baseball standpoint? Uh, Anybody? For me, I, I see more pitchers, yeah. uh, but certainly see the position players as well. Um, it's really mo mostly outfielders, pitchers, and catchers. Not many infielders. Yeah, I would echo that. I, I probably see it more in pitchers, but that would be interesting to actually comb through our hits data to actually see uh, if, the, if the, what the what the prevalence of of what position. Yeah, yeah, it's it's screaming for a study, isn't it? Uh, we should we should get on that. So Let's get on it. Uh, uh, Nancy, uh, one more question, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up. Um, all right. What are your feelings on dead arm? I know a few doctors that feel like it's the early signs or onset of thoracic outlet. I, I mean, I, I'll go ahead. No, go ahead, Reagan. Well, I was going to say, like, gonna you say know, like, to the diagnosis of, uh, of TOS doesn't have to be a full-blown TOS. I, I would argue that, that like even the purpose of these talks today, bringing light to understanding the diagnosis of TOS will hopefully allow us to recognize that it does exist. So I, I, would, I would step on a limb that a lot of pitchers deal with even subclinical signs of it, and it's a form of TOS. They may not be on the red line, but they get to a certain area, but they can function. But it, you could still apply these just throughout the board, and it could help probably prevent some of these from getting into a, to a big problem. Um, so the, a dead arm type of feeling is, is essentially a performance fatigue, um, in my opinion. Yeah, what's yeah. interesting though is pitchers, you see this in spring training, uh, they'll, they'll go through a, a week or so where they complain of dead arm. They can't explain it. They call it fatigue and they have to kind of get through it, which kind of doesn't sound like TOS, like you can move through this unless something else changes. But mostly, and, and Sue, when you were with the Dodgers, I mean, you get dead arm all the time. What do you do with it? You just sort of wait it out in a way. Uh, you give them more rest or that kind of thing. And I suppose if, if it is a TOS with some restrictions, either pec minor tightness or something else because of fatigue, you might have that. Sue, what do you remember about all that? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with Regan. I mean, I think that there's a lot of TOS isn't necessarily a diagnosis of have or have not. There are varying um, degrees of, of clinical intensity. And so, yeah, I think that even though we don't really think about it, you're right, we just sort of like waited it out a little bit and did some extra quote unquote recovery stuff. But, um, you know, just sort of waiting for their body to kind of adapt to the increase in volume or the increase in load. And, and sometimes tissue adaptation is what you need in order to kind of create a little bit of space for the neurovascular structure. So, you know, maybe it doesn't necessarily change what we do clinically, but yeah, I think, I think rational, from a rational standpoint, um, it makes sense that it might be a, a variance or a, of an intensity of a TOS. Great. Well, uh, listen, this has been a really great um, uh, presentation on this. We got a lot of different views on uh, different things. Uh, uh, I just want to talk about uh, uh, next week. Um, um, this is our, our next week presentation. Um, uh, shoulder instability, again, another one of those that a lot of people want to talk about. It, car it carries a very big 
area and shoulder st stability. Um, and um, I think Nancy's putting up the, the poll now, if you want to go through that and, and uh, fill out the poll the best you can. Uh, but we were fortunate enough to get uh, Dr. Neil Elitrosh, who really is uh, the expert on shoulders in, in regards to pitchers. Um, uh, he, would, he would say he's an expert in all the joints, but uh, definitely in instability. Uh, Joe Benji uh, from um, Tampa Bay is, is going to be talking on some of the rehab stuff. Uh, and Nick Conti, I don't know really who he is, but uh, he's supposed to be pretty good. And um, uh, he's going to be talking on scapular dyskinesia and how he affects uh, using serratus and lower traps to get the scapula where we need to go uh, that will help shoulder uh, stability. So that's, that's for next week. Uh, so I hope everybody is able to, to make next week. Uh, we'll be sending out uh, uh, the invites again uh, on probably Friday. Uh, we're also, we'll put uh, this, this presentation on video on contiperformance.com. Uh, the other ones are on there as well that you can look at. Those are all free. Uh, and you can go back through uh, the presentation and, and take a look at this stuff. Again, thank you very much for uh, the speakers. A great job. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next week.